the computers in here didn't work, but we've gotten it all straightened out, sounds like, and we are now ready to go. Thanks for joining us for the City of Oklahoma City's video conference City Council meeting. We have a few announcements to make. If the video conference is disconnected at any time during the meeting, the meeting shall be stopped and reconvened once the audio connection is restored. If communications are unable to be restored within 30 minutes, items remaining for consideration will be continued to later today, July 21st at one o'clock via video teleconference unless we uh, indicate a different time. The agenda and documents are located on okc.gov. Anyone wishing to speak about an agenda item, public hearing, or to speak and your citizens to be heard, must call 405-297-2391 or text 405-219-7927 or email cityclerk at okc.gov to be allowed to speak. When recognized to speak, press star six to unmute your device. Visitors, uh, speakers will be allowed three minutes to con comment. Now we would like to begin with our invocation uh, led by, no doubt, the very patient Reverend Mark Williams and uh, from, I believe that should be Anglican Church of the Holy Cross. Correct, yeah. Reverend Williams, welcome. Thank you for your patience and uh, please start when you're ready. All right, thank you for the privilege. Let us pray. O God, the fountain of wisdom, whose statutes are good and gracious and whose law is truth. We beseech thee so to guide these members and bless this meeting of the Oklahoma City Council, that it may ordain for thy governance such things as please thee, to the glory of thy name, and to the welfare of the people, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Whereas Jared Shaded has been a city employee for seven years and works in the planning department, coordinating social services for people who are experiencing homeless. And whereas Jared Shadid manages several grants, including the Emergency Solutions Grant, the Housing Opportunities for Person with AIDS Grant, and continuum of care fund ensuring contracts are in place with service providers and that regulatory and reporting requirements are met. And whereas Jared Shaded successfully leads the coordination of numerous service providers and volunteers in conducting the annual point in time count, which is held each January and provides a single day count of those who are experiencing homelessness in our community, as well as looking into the causes and conditions of homelessness. And whereas Jared developed and manages a winter shelter contingency plan to increase emergency shelter capacity when the weather dips below freezing, which saves the lives of people experiencing homelessness each year. Whereas Jared helped launch respite facilities for those who are medically frail and others who are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 in Oklahoma City's homeless community. Whereas this council desires to recognize Jared for his dedication and passion for reducing the occurrence of homelessness in Oklahoma City. Now therefore be it resolved by the mayor and council of the city of Oklahoma City that they do hereby thank and commend Jared Shaded, July 2020 South Oklahoma City Juanas Club Employee of the Month. Thank you, Francis. And this is a resolution. So is there a uh, motion to adopt it? We've got a motion and a second. Um, I'm not, I'm on, uh, okay. Ah, there we go. Okay. Cast your votes. Okay. 
Mayor, I'm having trouble casting a vote. I, I, I vote yes. Okay. Got it. That was Councilman Stonecipher and the motion passes unanimously. Jared, are you on the line? I am, yes. Well, congratulations and uh, thank you for your service. And I, I know you've had a big year with the, uh, the task force and the creation of this new plan moving forward. Thank you for that. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, sure, yeah, just uh, thank you for the recognition. Of course, we do a, have a lot of good service providers that we work with that uh, make this a lot less difficult. They all do a lot of that heavy lifting, but I, I do appreciate the uh, small part I play in it. So I uh, just wanna say thanks. Thank you. Okay. Well, uh, that concludes Office of the Mayor. We'll now move to Journal of Council Proceedings where we have items A and B we can take with one motion. We've got a motion and a second. Cast your vote. Councilman Stonecipher, can you see your voting screen? I, I get the motion. It's moved by Todd. Have you pushed escape? Yeah, yeah, got it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, great. Passes unanimously. Request for uncontested continuances. Item five, Mr. City Manager, anything on that list today? Yes. On page three, MFA, item H1, we're gonna strike this item um, to make some corrections on the item. And then on page 17, Item 7BG1, this is the companion workers comp item to the one that we just struck from the MFA. We'll strike this item also to make corrections on the item. On well, page, Mr. City Manager, what item was that again? BG1. Okay, got it. On page 20, item 7BX3, we're gonna strike this item. Um, there's a dispute over the amount of the claim. On page 22, item 9A1, this is PUD 1755. And we have a request from the applicant to defer this item to August the 4th. Page 23, item 9A2, PUD 1768. This is a request by both the council member and by the applicant to defer the item to August the 4th. On page 23, item 9E1, under dilapidated structures. We're gonna strike all of these items. Item C, 1641 Northeast 30th Street, the owner has removed. And item D, 235 Southeast 40th Street, the owner has repaired. On page 24, item 9F1, unsecured structures. We'll strike these items from the agenda. Item D, 3528 Northwest 14th Street, the owner is secured. And item I, 2705 Southeast 45th Street, the owner is secured. On page 24, item 9G1, abandoned buildings. We'll strike these items from the agenda. Item E, 3528 Northwest 14th Street, the owner is secured. Item F, 235 Southeast 40th Street, the owner is secured. And that is all the items I have. Okay. Item six, revocable permits. There are none listed. We'll recess the council meeting, convene at the Oklahoma City Municipal Facilities Authority, where we have items, uh, a through I, uh, other, and of course, H1 was just uh, struck A through I that we can take with one motion. Move the item. Got a motion and a second, cast your vote. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn as the MFA, convene as the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority, where we have items A and B we can take with one motion. Move the items. We've got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. 
or do we? There we go. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCPPA, convene as the Oklahoma City Environmental Assistance Trust, where we just have item A, claims and payroll. We'll go ahead and vote on that as well, if someone would like to make a motion. Got a motion and a second, cast your vote. Passes unanimously. We'll adjourn OCEAT uh, and convene as, reconvene as the council, where we find ourselves on page four of your printed agenda, item seven, the consent docket. I know we have presentations scheduled on items AQ, BA, B, C, B, D, B, N. And then we had a couple items struck at the beginning of the meeting. Are there any other items that council members would like to pull out for separate discussion or for a separate vote? Yes, I would like um, B, W pulled out for discussion. B, W. Okay. Anything else? All right. Oh, yeah, go ahead. A -Y, I have a correction I need to make. Oh yeah, A Y a correction. Go ahead. So on A Y, the public hearing is noted as August the twenty. Order then, what means Mayor? Can you all hear me? Yeah. I, can hear, I can hear you, James, but I can't hear Craig. Yeah, same. Thanks, Mark. Craig, Craig you're muted. The mayor is unmuted. So the mayor just got kicked off, I think. <laughs> yeah. So we're trying to work through that. Did you, one. Have, Did one you one have another one you wanted to consider, consider Councilman? Yeah. Councilman Cooper? Yes, sir. Uh, I was I was wanting to hear a little bit more about um, not necessarily the plot for a separate vote or anything, but seven uh, X and Y um, three. Just want to hear a little bit more about that art and seven um, Z. What? I said something about A1 public hearing. And no one could hear that. And, uh, I had a couple as well, Mayor. I'm not sure if uh, Councilman's done. Councilperson Cooper's done. I, I'm just waiting. I don't know where we are. Hey, Councilman Cooper, can you hear me? Yes, Mayor. Okay. You were cutting in and out on my end, but did you say item X? I did say item X. And then what was the other one? Y3. Okay. And then uh -huh, 7Z. It's retroactive. Z is in zebra? Yes. All, all of them, one, two, and three? Uh, just one, sorry. Okay. And then um, AN under seven. Okay. And um, AP2. Okay. A AS. AS is in Sam. Mm -hmm. And I heard you say earlier that AY is going to be something we discuss. AY. 
So I don't know, we're unclear if anyone heard this. Somebody came in the room and said that it was cutting out. AY is supposed to be corrected to August 18th. Okay. That was what the city manager said earlier. Uh, and we are considering that a Scrivener's error. Instead of August 28th, that date should be August 18th. So that, that's all on AY. If you want to talk about it, uh, let me know. I was just curious to hear a little bit more. And, okay. Uh, um, Oh yeah, and then uh, B R. B R. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then B S. Okay. And uh, and B T. Okay. Thank you. And Councilwoman Nice, did I hear you say you had some things too? Yes, please. Um, item V as in Victor. Um, item Y, one and two. And um, item AL3. I just wanted, I just had a, a couple of questions, couple questions, and then just wanted a discussion on a couple. You say AL3? Okay. Yes. Okay. Anything else? That's it for me. All right. Okay, so we'll take them in order, which I believe brings us back to you, Councilwoman Nice. Item V. V is in Victor. Item V is in Victor. Okay, I just wanted to make mention of of this uh, development that is coming with uh, FaithWorks, and I just wanted to mention uh, FaithWorks. They are a nonprofit doing some some great work uh, in the community, and I know last last year, probably around this time. I went to visit uh, the facility and also they showed me the area where they wanted to develop some single family homes uh, for for the community that's around them uh, and turn some of our, our renters into to get them into more stable uh, living environments. So I just wanted to make mention of that and uh, again commend them for the great work that they're doing and also uh, just for those who are uh, watching and just kind of understanding how how these developments work, they take time. So as you see, even with this one, um, they showed it to me last year and here we are uh, with them now getting ready to get the final uh, works into place so they can start the actual development of this project. So I just wanted to make mention of that. So I appreciate the opportunity for that. Thank you. Okay, item X, Councilman Cooper. Yes, I was just wondering if we had someone to speak to um, the specifics of this and what um, I, I just really like this grant a lot as somebody who toured our uh, homeless or sorry, our uh, animal shelter um, uh, last yes, year. Sir. Yeah, thanks. Jarita Becker is on from um, Animal Welfare to speak to this. Thank you. Jareed, are you on the line? If Jareed can't connect, um, Bob Teener is on to speak to this. This is Bob Teener, Development Services uh, Director. Uh, this is an organ a national organization that helps uh, local shelters try to meet that 90% live release rate. And uh, this proposal will allow us to use that, those funds for our foster program, which is a really important part of our uh, meeting our live release rate goals. And the staff out there works really hard with our volunteers to, to do that. I think our last, we were right around 86% on our live release rate. So we're, they're doing really, really a good job and this will just help us continue that job. Yeah, I really appreciate you taking time to walk us through that. The last year, I, as you all might recall, I toured the animal shelter the same week I toured a new veterans homeless shelter and the same week I toured our Oklahoma County Jail. And all three of those experiences were just blazoned in my memory. Um, and one of the things I took away from the animal shelter was it, uh, the importance of the foster program and um, the importance of having enough folk to be able to take care of, of um, these animals in the smaller space that we have right now as a shelter. Um, 
and it just reminded me a lot of why the maps for animal shelter was so important as well. So, um, thank you. Thanks. Okay, item uh, Y one and two. Uh, Councilwoman Nice wish to speak about item Y and Y three. Councilman Cooper wish to speak about. Uh, thank you. Item uh, Y one. I know we have uh, we received the art as far as what's supposed to be for the spe ward, specific wards, but I was just kind of curious as to which actual uh, piece from MJ Alexander is expected to be placed in Ward 7 at the Dolphin Wardson Park. So R Randy Marks is on from the planning department and he can talk to Y1, 2, and 3. And this is, good morning, this is Randy Marks, a public art project manager. In Ward 7 at Dolphin Wardson Park, there will actually be two of the poems that will be used so the poems will be applied in two different way. Um, there will be a steel stencil made of each of the poems, Path Poem 1 and Path Poem 2 by M.J. Alexander. And at Dolphin Horton, one of the poems will be sandblasted into the surface of either the trail or the floor of the picnic pavilion. And then the uh, other poem will be turned, the, the actual stencil for the other poem will be turned into a steel sculptural landscape element. And the reason that both of those will be at Dauphin Wharton is because uh, it has a little bit larger budget, 1% for our budget than the other four parks do. Okay, um, thank you. Certainly. And then um, I know, I just wanted, as far as item two, I just wanted to mention that I am excited about what this particular uh, sculpture will bring for the USA Softball Hall of Fame. Um, just within the last, I think, couple of weeks, they had a, a viewing of the new work that's been done. And I got to see it from the balcony of where this particular sculpture will begin and where it will actually land. So I think once people actually see it and, and get to experience this particular sculpture, the softball, um, it's definitely going to be a landing piece and in a, in a place where we'll see a lot of photographs being taken <laughs> uh, for this piece. So if you, if you may just speak a little bit to it, that would be great. So the, uh, select, excuse me, the selection committee, and of course you were able to participate on that, and thank you for that, uh, chose artist Pete Beeman, who's, who is based out of both New York and Portland, for this particular project, which is titled Trajectory. And as you indicated, it illustrates a softball that is being knocked out of the state of the stadium. And the trajectory of the softball as it bounds out of the state stadium and into the plaza below uh, will be created out of stainless steel too. And then the ball is a cast glass piece that will be lighted and it'll be about uh, around three feet tall. And that will be out in the plaza at the main entrance to the stadium. Then further on down the plaza, which they call the spine, you'll see the ball again in another trajectory, which illustrates the ball as it continues on its path. So there'll be two opportunities where people can gather around and take those photographs. John Miller, the COO at USA Softball specifically, was wanting an Instagrammable moment for the thousands of people that come to the softball stadium every year. And we certainly feel like that this um, meets that requirement. I definitely agree with that. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilman Cooper, item three. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I was just looking to uh, hear a little bit more uh, about this particular project. It looks uh, pretty exciting. Well, we think so too. Um, so recent improvements at the OKC Tennis Center at Will Rogers Park include a new clubhouse that is just about completed. So working with an idea from ADG architect Issa Valferia, we saw the opportunity to do something unique and beautiful and functional all at the same time, which was to create a vestibule as a distinctive and inviting entrance to the building. 
the selection committee chose the design presented by a, a, an artist team that includes local artist Anton Morton and Brett McDowell, along with an internationally known glass artist from England, Martin Donlin. So the result is a composition that is colorful, uh, both the glass is colorful and the metal that will be part of it will be colorful and it'll be lighted from the inside. So we feel like that it'll be something that really draws people to the entrance of that facility. The, yes, the artwork is, is just beautiful. Um, and anybody watching at home can find it on our agenda um, out there. I, I just really appreciate um, the work there at Roy Rogers Park. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to the next item, which is uh, Z1, Councilman Cooper. I was just requesting um, to hear a little bit more uh, about the, um, where we are with the Britain District at this point. I believe Kim Cooper Hart should be on. Or is there someone else from the planning department that can speak to this if Kim is not on? Kim, okay. Hi. Good morning. This is Kim Cooper Hart with the planning department. Um, good morning, Councilman Cooper. The Britain District is starting its second year with the city's commercial district revitalization program. And their plans this year are to do a strategic plan for their organization and their district. They have a part-time director that will be working with them. So this is their first paid staff function that they've had since they've joined the program. And one of the key things they wanna do is look at beautification for the Britain and Western intersection. They have uh, a street resurfacing from the general obligation bond coming up in the next couple, three years. And we're looking at the scheduling of that. And uh, as has been talked in the community uh, neighborhood enhancement board with a better street, better street sales tax, the potential for some excess money to maybe be spent on a street enhancement. Wonderful, thank you, uh, Kim, for your work. I'm wondering uh, what, I know that whenever a new development is happening, uh, there's that 300 foot radius uh, wherein we notify uh, people uh, surrounding that potential application uh, for rezoning. I'm curious uh, what, it, what we could do to think an application is right outside of the Britain district, but it's in one of the kind of surrounding neighborhoods where they're hoping to you know, really serve um, as they keep bringing businesses there in the infrastructure. Um, what could a conversation look like where um, the Britain District Board uh, was able to uh, receive notifications when um, an application is just outside of that 300 feet, but it's something in such close proximity to the Britain District? Is something like that possible? I believe so. I can talk to Bob Teener about that. I know sometimes we notify neighborhood districts when there are surrounding um, developments. So let me take that up with Bob and we'll see what we can do. Yeah, that's wonderful. Uh, I've heard you say before, uh, a lot of these uh, district boards are almost, you know, really a great exercise in, um, in democracy at that much smaller granular le level. And in my mind, it just makes sense if we can, if we can, to try and help those folk over there um, you know, better understand the zoning process for people uh, outside of their boundaries and even with them, but just making sure that they're having conversations with people who are wanting to become their neighbors over the next few years. I'm really excited about that area, as you know. I do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Kim. You're welcome. Okay, let's see. Next item would be item AL3. On page 11, Councilwoman Knight. Hey, AL3, I just yeah. uh, really just wanted to mention um, that we had the street resurfacing from Northeast 36th Street to Wilshire. 
um, on Sooner. So I know we have had quite a few phone calls throughout uh, the tenure that I've been here about our different roads out in that area. So I just wanted to make mention of that. And also um, I was gonna include in my council comments, but for the sake of talking about this residential street resurfacing, I uh, just wanna thank our uh, public works department as well as our relationship with our uh, commissioner, Carrie Bloomer, it's for us to be able to work with the city of Luther uh, to get a triple X road, I believe that's, I, I get them, they're so way out there, but one of those streets out there for that they have been very concerned about um, as far as getting it resurfaced. So they did a live video of it and, and wrote on it and, and uh, explained how they were excited. So I just want to make mention of those things. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, now item AN, Councilman Cooper. Yes, um, I know I'm planning to attend an event later this week about the Belle Isle Library, and I was just curious if uh, someone involved might be able to speak to um, what this item is, this amendment is gonna mean for this particular area and project. Councilman Cooper, this is Eric Winger. So I can, I can answer your questions on 7 a.m. This is an amendment to an agreement between uh, the Metropolitan Library System and the City of Oklahoma City. Um, there were donations that were received specific to the Bell Isle Library that are part of the construction that's actually currently out to bid. So this action today will receive $950,000 um, to be added to the project for additional enhancements that the Metropolitan Library System wanted to complete as part of the overall $8 million project. Wonderful, thank you. I'm very, again, as much as I'm excited about the Britain District, I'm very much looking forward to seeing this library project come to life. Thank you, Eric. All right, uh, we'll stay with you, Councilman Cooper, for item AP2. Staying with me and staying on Northwest Expressway. Um, I was wanting to hear a little bit more about this particular item as well, please. This is Eric Winger again, Director of Public Works, Councilman Cooper, and I can answer the questions on this one as well. You might recall from a previous presentation on the Bell Owl improvements, um, we answered some questions about a enhanced crossing for pedestrians at Northwest Expressway and Villa. And so this is the funding um, to advance that project will be a separate project from the library, but it will be a companion project. So approving this today will authorize those funds to be used for Crosswalk enhancements and to improve that walkability across Northwest Expressway connecting to LL Library. Yeah, thank, and again, thank you. Uh, when I was knocking doors, as I've said before, um, neighbors on both sides of uh, Northwest Expressway are very interested in this project. May I ask, as we are doing this particular uh, crosswalk enhancement, I know that bike infrastructure is also scheduled for Villa heading north uh, there. Are we coinciding with those particular projects or does the funding for the bike infrastructure and better streets come later or what does that look like? Yeah, I need to double check the schedule, but our goal would be to have those coincide as much as possible, um, but they are gonna be separate projects. So we are working with the different staff on the different teams that are affecting that construction. And so, yes, we'll try to make that happen simultaneously. Thank you, Eric. So mayor is getting changed over here. We've got um, problems with his connection. So we're getting him changed over. The next item that we had was item AQ is a presentation on the um, community and neighborhood enhancements program project. This is just an update on the plan. And Eric Winger is with us to make a presentation on this. Thank you, Mr. City Manager. I'm gonna go ahead and share a screen to bring up uh, the presentation. Can everybody see this on their screen? It should look like the implementation plan. Okay. So I'm, I'm pleased to present um, the July 2020 update to the Better Street Safer City um, program. Um, so this is an implementation plan amendment. You've seen these before, um, but I'll, I'll highlight some of the items that are included in this one. 
Um, just as a program summary for Better Street Safer City, began in January 1st on 2018. It's a pay as you go, but we did receive the final collections on March 31st, 2020. And this was the breakdown of the program, which was estimated at $240 million. Recall the majority was in street resurfacing at 168 million, but it also included streetscapes, sidewalks, trails, and bike facilities. And the program's been very active for the past two years. Um, we've had regular monthly meetings with the advisory board, um, and they've helped make recommendations to the city council um, for each of those project categories, which I now have on the screen. And of the funding that's been made available, this is the percentage of each of those categories that has been authorized. So you'll see nearly 90 or 90 plus percent in every category except for bicycle infrastructure. But we've reserved a little bit in bicycle infrastructure just as we've met some infield challenges and are just making sure that we've addressed those projects correctly. So we've advanced very quickly, but with a lot of projects underway, we do need budget amendments from time to time. And there's two that are included in this implementation plan amendment. The first is a residential resurfacing project. This is an area bound between May 89th Pennsylvania Avenue and Southwest 74. As they were in this neighborhood and doing this work, they found that the streets were in worse condition than expected, requiring additional funds. The total amendment or the increase in cost for this neighborhood would be $591,934. This and the next item are fully funded, so there's no additional funds that are going to be required. These are in reserves for better streets, safer city. The next and second Project to be amended is a sidewalk project. Um, this is near the Highland Park Elementary School. There are some additional streets that needed to, or additional connections that needed to be considered. And so we're asking for an amendment of $214,159. So for the, for the dozens, if not hundreds of street resurfacing projects that we do, um, we're not having to amend each one of those. There are some project contingencies that are available, but every once in a while, like these two projects, we find that we need to come to the city council requesting that we do budget amendments on individual projects. These are recommended by the advisory board, and so we're asking for council's approval of those today. I can answer any questions you might have about this item. Any questions for Eric? All right, thank you, Eric. Okay, that brings us to item AF, F is in Sam, uh, Councilman Cooper. Yes, uh, let's see. Yeah, I see this is for, um, it's a special permit. So I'm just kind of curious uh, how this came about and what are the longevity possibilities, if any at all? Councilman, this is Chris Browning, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Okay, this, this permit was originally issued in 2003 uh, between the Water Trust and the uh, Partners for Animal Welfare of Oklahoma. It's a three-year renewal, so it will extend this uh, permit all the way through July 31st, 2023. Uh, they are a private group who have been uh, self-managing this, this dog park since 2003, and it's located on the east side of Hefner Parkway, uh, right next to a, a, a baseball park that we also issue a permit to operate. And yeah, so it looks like we're good at least through 2023. So okay. yes, sir. That, the 2003 background is uh, helpful as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, that brings us to item AY, which again has been corrected. Uh, the date here should be August 18th, not August 28th. Uh, Councilman Cooper, you wanted to talk about it? I was just going to hear um, a little bit more. I remember this was on our agenda earlier in the, the year, I feel like, or maybe even late last year. I was just curious of an update. Yes, we, we had a presentation on this previously by Jane Jenkins. I've got Lacey Kelly is on the line to speak to just kind of the process and remind us of the process that we go through for the business improvement districts. But then Jane is also on the line uh, if you have any other questions. 
Good morning, Mayor and Council. Um, as Councilman Cooper said, this item is the second item in a three-step process to renew the, the downtown bid for another 10-year period. The first item the Council saw was on May 26. The City Clerk received petitions to renew the bid from 60.22% of the ownership within the proposed bid boundaries. Uh, this resolution sets a public hearing and a publication in the journal record and mailing notice to all of the property owners within the bid, letting them know that on August 18th, the council will have a public hearing and a vote to confirm and create the bid for another 10 year period. And then we'll have another uh, two step process in late August, early September to confirm the assessment rule for year one of generation three of the bid will adopt the bid budget and the professional services agreement with downtown OKC to manage the bid and put on the events and pick up the trash and do all of that great stuff. And Jane Jenkins with downtown OKC is also on the line if you have any other questions. Yeah, that that helps uh, me. If, if Jane would like to say anything, she's more than welcome to. I'm, I'm good otherwise. Okay. All right, moving on to item BA. I know we have a presentation scheduled here. Yes, I asked uh, Doug Daller, our budget director, to provide just some remarks on the professional services agreement. We also have um, the uh, IMSA budget is on, on BB for the council to receive that. So Doug will make some remarks on this. And then Jim Wenham, the IMSA uh, CEO, is also on the line if there are specific questions for him. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Yeah, just briefly on this uh, professional services agreement between the city and IMSA. This lays out the relationship between the two parties in connection to our IMSA care program that we do through uh, the utility bill, uh, where residents can choose to pay the $365 a month uh, to receive IMSA care coverage, how we uh, get those funds to IMSA to cover uh, their costs. It also includes in there a provision that will purchase capital for IMSA, such as ambulances, uh, and other capital equipment will own those assets and then lease them to MSA at no cost uh, with the idea being if at some point ever in the future uh, there were ever to be a change in the city were to take over ambulance service we would have those assets available. Uh, in the coming year we're also working on an agreement to purchase uh, a facility for MSA. They've been leasing a facility uh, but that's still uh, being worked out the details for that. But this uh, professional services agreement does contemplate that uh, uh, purchase of a building as well uh, as the other capital equipment that we do. So this is just really, again, laying out that relationship between the city and IMSA and how we handle those again. and the responsibilities. And then uh, on the IMSA budget that's uh, also coming up here, uh, this is the, uh, the budget has to be received by the city because we're the beneficiary of the trust. Uh, IMSA is a trust between the city of Tulsa and Oklahoma City. Uh, they divide between Western and Eastern division in IMSA, uh, again, to separate the Tulsa area from the Oklahoma City area. On the, for this coming year, our subsidy for IMSA will be $4,700,000. And again, that IMSA care uh, money that we collect is, is sufficient to cover that, uh, that cost uh, for, for the city next year. Um, the IMSA budget was approved by the uh, IMSA Board of Trustees at their June meeting. All the city has to do is receive it, but we want to make sure that you're aware of, of what's going on there at IMSA and uh, what the budget is for this coming year for them. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Doug? Okay, that brings us to items B, C, and B, D. I believe you have presentations from Brent Bryant on those. Yes, Brent Bryan, our finance director, is going to give us an overview on these items. We had some items on last meeting that related to, so they were similar to this, their agreements of support for the Oklahoma City Economic Development Trust. These apply to two additional trusts, and so I wanted Brent just to reiterate what this is and what we're committing to here. All right. Good morning, uh, Brent Bryant, finance director. Um, items B, C, and B, D um, are provided to you today for uh, your consideration. In both situations, when the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority and the, uh, there you go, when the Oklahoma City Public Property Authority and the Central Oklahoma Transportation and Parking Authority uh, went out to borrow funds, 
uh, they sought the city, the city provided a backstop or an agreement of support in order to uh, support the financings. And as a result of that, that always helps us with our financing costs, which typically lowers our financing costs. This is an annual thing, which we did last week for our economic development trusts, uh, outstanding debt. Uh, we have to uh, renew this debt on an annual basis. And so what we're seeking here today is get your approval to approve these agreements of support. It's only for the, the retroactive back to July 1 through June 30, and it will continue to help, help keep us in good standing with our creditors and, and with our rating agencies. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Any questions for Brent? Okay. That brings us to item B in, as in Nancy, I believe there's a presentation on this. Yes, uh, this is the item that is selecting ADG or it's authorizing negotiation to select ADG to go with a contract with ADG for the Mass Four Program Consultant. I asked Eric Winger and David Todd to just make some remarks on this and let us know what this process was and what the recommendation is. Sorry about that. I have to try to get it unmuted. We're having a little bit of difficulty too. Um, so on the item receiving the consultant review committee report for the Matt Sport program consultant, just to provide a little bit of background about how the process works. When we select architects and engineers and consultants um, for the city of Oklahoma City, we're actually using a council resolution that actually goes back to November of 1986. So it's a well-established process that uses qualifications-based selection. Um, we advertise a project. In this case, it was advertised for consultants who had interest on January 10th of 2020. And we did receive four proposals and they were received from ADG, Brentford Short and Brugia, Jacobs and Cooper Project Advisors. Um, interviews were scheduled for June the 12th and completed. And the committee in this case that, that reviewed those proposals and, and sat in on those interviews included a uh, representative of the city manager's office, the MAPS project office, the public works department, but then also two of the citizens advisory board members. So the chairperson, Teresa Rose Crook, and also uh, member Bob Nealon were able to participate uh, in that process. And so as we go through and we receive those interviews, uh, we get to the point where we are today where a recommendation is made from that committee for the council to consider. Um, this item has also been through the advisory board. I think David Todd's also available to, to add some additional detail from the advisory board meeting and, and also going forward from here. That's right. David Todd here, MAPS program managers. As Eric said, this, this is a standard procedure that we've used for all consultants within the MAPS programs, you know, clear back to MAPS for Kids, MAPS 3, and now starting with MAPS 4, it involved um, two members of the advisory board. Um, so they, you know, they had uh, equal say in, in the interviews. So th this is just more of the same process that you're seeing starting with MAPS 4 that we've done in the past. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. We'll move on to uh, BR, BS, BT, Councilman Cooper. Those are your three and you can just run right through them. Yeah, I was, as a former middle school teacher, um, I was just interested in hearing more about these crossing guard agreements and uh, I see more public schools, I see Putnam Public Schools. I'm just curious um, how many districts we serve with this particular um, approach. I, I, I know I seem to recall hearing a need for them when I uh, was serving for OKCPS in the classrooms. Uh, yes, Councilman. Uh, Chief Gorley is on the line and he can speak to that. Morning, Councilman Cooper, Chief Gorley, Police Department. Um, these are our schools, even though they're, they're other districts, they have schools that reside in Oklahoma city limits. And so we contract with those schools to provide uh, crossing guards 
um, at higher traffic areas, uh, areas that are a little bit more dangerous for the kids to cross. And the schools pay a portion of that um, as well. So that's why you see the, the sort of the, um, the uh, revenue side of that. It's not just that total cost. We pay for about half and the schools pay for half of it. And we have similar arrangements with um, other school districts as well. I see more in Putnam, like I said. And yeah, I, I take that they're in our boundaries. I'm just curious uh, what that looks like across the, the city. Yes, um, Oklahoma City uh, schools, you'll see them in the next, uh, probably in the next couple of council meetings. Um, that, that contract just hasn't made it yet. But we also have uh, Edmond, uh, Millwood, and Piedmont schools as well that have schools within the Oklahoma City limits. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chief. You bet. Councilman Cooper, you just want to roll into B. Yes, I'm, <clears throat> I'm curious um, if we can just kind of speak to this item and then um, relatedly, I've had a constituent reach out to ask about, and I know we've been through this number before uh, uh, in our budget, the percent of uh, uh, city, the, the fines and fees that go to our uh, general fund. So it's kind of two separate things at once there. So your first question, Councilman, is in regard to the jail services agreement? Yes, please. Okay. Chief Gorley can answer the, any questions that you have specifically. This is our agreement that we have. That's a, there's a couple of different items that are in there, the per prisoner day cost, and I think there's some additional services that we provide that help us comply, be in compliance with state law. Um, is there a specific question that you have in regard to that? I think one of the things I just would like to hear um, us speak more publicly about is, um, you know, what I kind of learned last year uh, when I took office about um, how, at what rates we see people um, put in Oklahoma County Jail based on municipal um, violations. Uh, I guess, in other words, it explains this agreement, um, you know, suggests that they're that we have people who might be in there based on city municipal charges. And I'm just curious um, what those percents are again. Um, yeah, I think that's my main question. I can't really speak to percentages. What I can tell you is um, uh, about three years ago, we started a site and release program. So very few municipal charges actually wind up in jail. Um, uh, the majority of those we officers can do site and release in the field. Also working with the courts, uh, with LaShawn and with Judge James, they do a really good job of not keeping people um, in, in our city jails or in the county jail for extended periods of time. They do what they can to try and get them out. If we do have to book someone in on a municipal charge, uh, they try to get them out before they actually have to go into the general population of the county jail. And they work very hard to do that. Probably Judge James or uh, um, LaShawn could speak more to about those particular charges and how that process is works. Process works. We average um, about 42 prisoners per day, which is down from uh, uh, last year. And also each year, it's been it's been gradually going down. And, and what you have to think about in that too is just because it's listed as a municipal charge. A lot of times too, when we book folks in on state charges, we back up those with municipal charges as well. So it may not be that they're just in on a municipal charge. They could be on a state felony charge or a state misdemeanor. Um, and if the DAs accept those charges, then oftentimes those city charges could be dropped in lieu of uh, the state felony or misdemeanor charges as well. So just because it, it may list that person as a city prisoner, they may not end up ultimately being charged with a municipal charge, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. And then, yeah, um, I'd like to hear a little bit more maybe from the municipal court side of things, especially as it relates to, and maybe even Doug Dowler, I remember him walking me through this once, the percent of um, um, that fines uh, play in terms of going into our general fund budget. Yeah, so Councilman, on the on the fines and fees, the 
fines and fees within the general fund budget make up about 3.7% of the budget. Thank you. Uh, like I said, a constituent had reached out about that. Mm -hmm. and I really appreciate being able to provide that answer. Sure. And then I don't know if there was anything uh, LaShawn would want to add um, to what Chief Gorley said. If not, then that's fine. Uh, council, uh, council person, LaShawn Thompson with Municipal Courts. Um, just like Chief Gourley said, um, we are with our site and release program and then our standing judicial orders that we have currently in place. Um, majority of our inmates are released within a 10 hour period. We have the mandatory o OR bond uh, program. And due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, there is a judicial, a standing judicial order that not our, all of our uh, city prisoners are released immediately uh, and they're not taken upstairs into custody. Thank you, uh, LaShawn, appreciate you. Thank you, Council. Okay, Councilman Cooper, you wanna continue on to item BT? Yeah, um, I was just wondering if we could provide everyone um, with a little bit of context for what Legal Aid Services does. This popped back out in my mind specifically because we're going to be seeing Legal Aid, as you all know, work with um, work with the city in terms of um, the eviction crisis uh, that COVID has is wrought. And quite frankly, there was already one prior. But just kind of curious to hear a little bit more about uh, what this service does and why it's uh, why we provide it. Yes, Councilman. Um, again, LaShawn Thompson of uh, Municipal Court. This agreement um, we've had in place with legal aid since 1974. This is an agreement that um, our public defenders provide services to our eligible clients. We have three attorneys that are assigned to our uh, adult division. So any uh, jury division case um, and a defendant is indigent, they will be provided with legal representation if they are eligible. And then it also provides uh, legal representations for any juvenile that is charged with our court, in our court. Thank you, Ms. Thompson. I appreciate your, uh, your taking time to provide context there. Thank you. Councilperson Cooper, is that is oh, that what you have? Did I have something else? No, no I have sorry, the next sorry. one. I, so yeah, I was yeah, just I'm gonna sorry. go for we, it. We yeah. had a discussion going in here. Yes, please go ahead, Councilman okay. Hammond on item BW. Yeah, I just wanted to ask about the process behind this consultant agreement and um kind of the I guess we'll start there, just what the process was to identify this individual and um whether that is similar or different to other consultant uh, processes we've gone through for other task forces. Yeah, so um, I'll speak to this first and then I'll let the mayor comment as well. Um, MT Barry was previously a, you know, worked in the police department for many years. He is a former police chief. He was an assistant city manager. He's well connected within the community too and is well connected within the um, and respected within the minority community. So we reached out to him, asked him about doing this. I will tell you, I want, I want to talk about the process as we go through, but I'd like to, for the mayor to be able to speak to his perspective on this too, where we reached out to MT and asked him to take a leadership role working with this task force. We felt like his skills and experience um, uniquely qualified him to serve in this role. And so I'll let the mayor speak to this and I'll talk more about the process. Yeah, so this is the, the law enforcement policy task force that is tasked with looking at our city's de-escalation policy and our city's accountability mechanism, which currently is the Citizens Advisory Board. And really, as Craig said, I mean, for me, you know, M.T. Barry, first of all, his integrity is just unquestionable. I mean, he's one of my, one of the people I admire most in the world, probably, much less the city. And, and he just, his experience and 
his his approach to this issue and you know i mean we obviously talked throughout this process to, to make sure that he was committed to the kind of change that i think we want to see through this task force all of those things you know make him a very unique person to be at the center of this discussion and so i asked him to be what we called the special advisor and facilitator of this task force now Craig will have to speak to the legalities of how you pick a consultant without competitive bidding and all those things. But I can speak to the fact that he brings an extremely unique set of skills, relationships, history uh, to this task. And there really simply wouldn't be anyone else in anywhere else on the planet that would be M.T. Barry at this moment and, and in this place. But I'd kind of kick it back to Craig to talk about, you know, technical process. Yeah, so this is not a, normally what we would go through. We do sometimes run into situations with consultants where we'll have a sole source provider that someone who has a specific skill working on a particular system or is the only one that's available to do this. This is not the same in this case, um, but really we did realize as we were looking through this, this item should have had also on here a... Um, a request to waive competitive bidding for the council to actually take action that based on the circumstances to choose to waive competitive bidding on this. We did not get this on this item. And so really what I would like to do is strike this item and bring it back to the council with a corrected, um, I don't believe we could, because we didn't notice it this way, we couldn't amend it on the floor here like this. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So we would legal is advised that we would need to strike this item and bring it back to the council. We should have had that on this item to clarify that. And that's my mistake. So um, we'll strike the F. Go ahead. Yeah, well, and I just, I also just one other question, I guess, since this is going to pop back up in maybe two weeks. Um, what is the process for determining where the funding for a position like this would come? Uh, yeah, I guess that's my question. In this situation, because of the um, unique circumstances working with the task force. Um, we're going to use what I've got funding in non-departmental for some professional services contracts. And I'm going to use that funding um, to be able to pay for this. Because my understanding of the non-departmental is that it's, and it literally says in the budget, the mission of non-departmental is to aggregate citywide funding needs that are not identified with any one department. And the fact that this is very particular to one department seems seems like not kind of what that money is really for. Yeah, no, no, that's right. And, and I understand that the, typically when we run into something like this, what we'll do is if we have funding in non-departmental for something like that, we can transfer it into a department and have it represented as an expenditure out of the department. Certainly something that we can do, um, but that was a funding source that I had available. And so I was able to, that was something that we could waive on doing other contracts to be able to do that. I guess my, and this is nothing against MT in particular, I also respect him greatly and, and think he was a great assistant city manager. I was not, obviously, I did not live in Oklahoma City when he was police chief, so I can't really speak to that, but I have just a few concerns with a consultant about particular policies that has been so embedded in the city and city organizational culture, rather than an outside voice who can bring things from the outside. And I think my easiest sort of, um, and then again, my other concern about this kind of large fund that is de non-departmental that doesn't feel like there's a lot of accountability in how that money is um, reported or, or allocated because my, again, my, my closest, I think, um, connection about how a task force consultant process is getting funded is a homelessness task force. And to me, there were a few things about that process that it's just a strange um, dichotomy of that process was, the idea was that, well, we needed to go through this, you know, I think even Mayor Holt at one point said, you know, we could talk to Dan Strawn and lock him in a room or have him be the consultant and, you know, they, they could come up with a, a plan and recommendations, but we need to go through this whole consultant process because we need community buy-in and we need, you know, a consultant that isn't sort of within that frame and structure already because of various dynamics. Well, that kind of seems like a, a pretty similar, I would say a similar need here, along with that was funded from a private foundation's money that was donated to the city for that purpose. And so the fact that for whatever reason, we don't 
pursue those monies through something like this when it comes to something like homelessness, but which literally is like a non-departmental function that affects literally every department within the city um, and every community within the city. And so it just, the, the disconnect for me of how we treated that task force and the process for that versus this one um, feels a little disjointed. So that's that's really what I wanted to speak to, but I guess we'll have another opportunity to to keep thinking about it. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And, and let me let me jump in real quick, just to be clear, and then I'll toss to the city manager. I believe the city manager intends to bring in an outside perspective as well. MT is more like, honestly, almost more like the staff for this. And, the, and that's the, there, there is no better word than facilitator. That's the one I chose. He's the facilitator for this endeavor. There's definitely going to be outside perspective brought in through another consultant. Is that correct, Mr. City Manager? Yes, that, that's what the plan would be. We wanted to get together with the task force to get that process initiated. Um, MT had some thoughts on some outside consultants we might recommend and discuss what options we might have to get that outside voice. So then MT would bring that history and understanding of our community and the department, and then we would potentially be looking at another source also to bring in that outside voice like you mentioned. And are we are there discussions already about how that consultancy will be funded? We, we have not had that yet. I think in the situation with the homelessness task force, there was an opportunity there that there was an outside organization that would help to fund that. Um, we could explore many different ways that we could possibly fund that. So we'll, we'll look at that as we get further in the process. I think I just, this Mark Stone Cyber here, um, I'd like to say, you know, I know Chief Barry, I trust him. I agree with what the mayor said. I admire his ethics and integrity. Um, he would make a wonderful facilitator. I'm, I'm kind of fearful. Uh, I'm reminded of, I guess I should say, the definition of a consultant uh, that I heard years ago. A consultant is a person that knows 175 different ways to build a bridge, but can't actually build one. Uh, M.T. Barry can build a bridge. He can build a bridge with members of the community. He can build a, a bridge with those that are going to serve on the committee. And so uh, I, I really admire M.T. Barry, and I think he's uniquely qualified for this position. Okay. Well, uh, so this item is struck. See, hearing no objection, we will strike this item, BW, because of um, failure to include some necessary language. We'll probably presume we'll see it back August 4th. Any other, while it's still here, any other comments or questions about it? Yes. Otherwise, we'll, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I, I would maybe ask us to consider as we, if this is going to come back up um, in two weeks, that we start also thinking about when I, if I'm hearing this conversation correctly, that we might also simultaneously go ahead and bring up whatever uh, bidding process um, for this this outside consulting. Or I think that doing these two um, at once worth our time. Well, well, is it fair to say that we would want the task force to be a part of that? Yeah, I think I think when we start the conversation with our first meeting, which we're still working to get scheduled, um, that we would need time to work through that, bring recommendations, and have discussions with the task force, decide on a path from there, and bring that back to the council. And I wouldn't expect that to be ready. For yeah. Meeting. So, so Councilman Cooper, we need MT Barry in place to start meeting with the task force. We need the task force to start meeting so that we can then bring in an outside consultant because we want them to be a part of that conversation. Is that, does that make sense? Does that sound fair? If this process as you two are describing it um, is our intention, then I would request that we um, describe in the uh, next uh, council memo what this process is going to look like. So just sure, so sure. What, what, what you and the city manager described, mayor, I think spelling that out so that, um, so everyone's aware of um, of this process, what it's going to look like. Sounds good. I, I wanted. I agree with that, and and uh, that was going to be my question. When would we have that first meeting? Because I know I've even had some folks reach out to me asking uh, when we would have that conversation. Um, and obviously, the the sooner 
uh, the better, especially as we're dealing with um, some contracting and bargaining that's, that's in place right now. Yeah, that's we're, we're working on getting the meeting together. It's, with 44 people on the task force, I think it's going to be difficult to be able to make sure we can meet everyone's schedules, but that's what we're trying to do right now is go through and start to work on checking schedules and get a location selected. Craig, are you shooting for early August? Is that kind of the yes. Goal? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and to the councilwoman's uh, point there too. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to need to. Uh, and I know this is all happening it, sort of breakneck urgency and speed, um, but for the sake of transparency and accountability, um, we need to be able to a spell out. To our people, what this, what this process is. I have a really bad habit, by the way, of um, thinking things in my head and uh, working things out there, and just believing people can read my mind. I, I it, it's literally something I, I do. I'm like, oh, we didn't talk about that. Um, so I kind of see this as one of those scenarios uh, where spelling it out in the language will be very helpful for people. Relatedly. Um, and this is to Councilwoman Nice's comments as well. Um, I've, I'm already receiving emails about what public engagement in each of these task force could look like. And going back to Councilwoman Hammond's uh, words, her, it's specifically her comparison to the homeless uh, task force that the mayor set up on which uh, I served with Councilwoman Nice and Hammond. Uh, even the public was in those, they were, they participated in those meetings. I'm thinking once where we met in the library, the group, uh, the task force, and then separately were chairs line for people, the public to, uh, to bear witness and to uh, add their, their comments. And I, I think with each one of these task force, um, we are establishing whether it's the human rights, whether it's the law enforcement one, whether it's the community policing um, stuff, I think each one of those are going to need a level of public engagement in those meetings for 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 there to truly be buy-in regarding whatever uh, recommendations these these respective groups um, suggest. Does that make sense? Yes. Um, you know, ultimately that's up to the task force. So I would I would also take the time maybe to communicate that to MT and and to members of the task force. When you say it's up to the task force, do you mean in terms of the public engagement? Yeah, I, I think any aspect of the task force operations is ultimately up to the task force. I mean, we can certainly encourage them and we should, but, and I, and I don't disagree with anything you just suggested, but I just mean, you should probably also communicate that to MT and, and mem maybe key members of the task force just, that you know. Well, my Wait, on the task force? Sorry. Councilman Cooper, you're on the task force as well, right? Yes, I'm on okay. the task force. Yeah, so, well, so, so you'll yeah, want to do that. Part of my well. understanding about the homelessness task force meetings that you're describing, Councilman Cooper, is that they were publicly posted meetings. So they there was a certain level of requirement of posting ahead of time the agenda as well as opportunity for public comment. Um, so some of it, I think, yes, it's up to the task force, but also as far as I understand, some of it is just literally, this is a public body that has to meet certain publishing requirements. So, so technically it is not a public body that requires those, those exact same rules. So it's something our plan is to post agendas to make them available to the public, but it doesn't fall under the exact same rules or it has the same requirements for open meeting. And the, the homeless task force was the same. It yeah. was not technically a public body, but it chose to behave as one. And, and yes, it would be our expectation that this one would choose, make that same choice. Yeah, I thank you. I cannot stress strongly enough how important that public side of it. I think we've made such a good step in the right direction by including the members of the uh, uh, public we have uh, from you know the diversity of backgrounds, whether it be law enforcement or uh, someone with sociology backgrounds, I think that's going to help the city, its residents feel more comfortable with whatever those recommendations are. I just also believe that that public component of this is 
in terms of um, being able to, like I said, bear witness and participate. Um, I just think that that is, it's just, it's gonna be fundamental to the success of whatever each group recommends. And I worry, and let me just, when I say that, I don't wanna dance around, I don't wanna beat around the bush there. Let me just be very clear. I think if there's not, then there, then we're gonna have some problems. I think that there are going to be people who are going to question the credibility of each group. Um, I just call it a hunch based on everything I've, uh, not just in my time in office, but just what I've seen generally. Um, I see this as an opportunity for local government to build that trust um, with its residents. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Well, that concludes the items that anybody had pulled out for separate discussion. So we can move now to a motion if we like. Any motion would be considered to be moving the consent docket without all of the items that have previously been struck. We have a motion and a second. Cast your vote. Let's see. Councilman McAtee. There we go. Passes unanimously. That brings us to item eight, the concurrence docket where we have items A through L we can take with one motion. Got a motion in a second, cast your vote. Pass unanimously. Now items nine, items requiring separate votes. Item A1 was struck or deferred, I forget. Item A2 is the same, which brings us to item 9B. These are ordinance on final hearing that were recommended for approval. Uh, we've got item 9B1, closing the 60 foot right of way of South Ellison Avenue, extending south from West Sheridan Avenue, 155 feet, Councilwoman Hammond. Yes, um, this is an item, uh, exactly like you said, it's essentially to just close a, what is a dead end street that runs right into the Oklahoma City Boulevard um, to be able to, for this group to do some future development on the property. So I will move for approval once that, up. We've got a motion and a second. Cast your vote. Passes unanimously. 9B2 is closing the rights of way and easements for the Map 3 Lower Downtown Park bounded by West I 40 and Southwest 15th, et cetera. Councilwoman Hammond. Similarly, just uh, uh, trying to get some right, rights of way cleared so that um, for future developments, I will move for approval. All right, we've got a motion and a second. Cast your vote. Passes unanimously. Okay, item 9C. Uh, this is a third of three meetings to consider an ordinance change. This is relating to motor vehicles and traffic and municipal court. I'm not even sure I recall what this is in regards to, Mr. City Manager. Can you remind us? This was deferred for March 31st. I'm oh, sure that's why I don't remember. This was deferred from like four months ago. Mm -hmm. We didn't talk about this before this meeting. What so yes. Yeah, there was a presentation <laughs> on this one. Okay. I was wondering if there was, because I, I was like, yeah, this is there's too much that's happened since then. But <laughs> I think I remember, I think it was myself and Councilman Cooper who were wanted to get this deferred so we could potentially gather more information related to to parking along the streetcar. So I'm, yeah, if, if there's a presentation to speak to that. Yeah, I don't think we had a presentation. We'd had a presentation previously on this item. 
And um, I don't know if, um, I don't remember, I think it was Street Steve Christ had worked with us on this one. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I seem to remember if, if, my, if my memory is correct, I seem to remember that Jason with Embark was gonna bring back data about sort of some of those hot spots and whether some of the, um, I know they were gonna put up maybe some signage and try to get some of those preventionary right. measures. Uh, so I think from my perspective, I'd love to hear maybe a report or a presentation on that to kind of inform your, us better. So is Jason on the line? Do you have Jason on there? Okay, let, let me, can we, can we move on past this yeah. one and we'll get Jason back on, uh, we'll get all the Jason and get him on and uh, make sure we've got him connected so he can speak to this one. Okay, let's take a look at the for now. Nine. Mayor, you're muted. Thank you. Okay, we will table item 9C for now. Moving on to 9D, this is an ordinance to be introduced set for public hearing August 4th, final hearing August 18th. Uh, relating to animal fees. Do we have somebody on the line to talk about this one, Mr. City Manager? Um, yeah, Dorita Becker. This is Bob Teener. I can speak to it. The, the proposed ordinance is to allow the superintendent, animal welfare superintendent to uh, modify adoption fees. Currently, the ordinance allows him to either reduce the fee by half or uh, eliminate the fee. And when we do adoption events with partners, sometimes it helps if we can have, we can set our fees at the same as the adoption partners. And that allows them to, uh, people to look at all the animals and uh, it helps us with that process. So that's all this ordinance is proposed to do. If there's any questions. Okay, any questions for Bob? Okay, hearing none, um, we could accept a motion to introduce the proposed ordinance change. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Motion passes unanimously. The ordinance change is introduced for consideration. Uh, again, it will have a public hearing on August 4th, potential final hearing on August 18th. We'll move on now to 9E. Uh, this is uh, 9E1 is the public hearing regarding the dilapidated structures here listed, except for those that were struck at the beginning of the meeting. Um, Francis, has anyone signed up to speak on this public hearing? All right, then we'll move on to, no one has signed up to speak, so we'll move on to 9E2 Mayor, and uh, would entertain a motion. Yes, go ahead. I, I wanted to see if, uh, I wanted to defer item B as in boy. Okay. 2204 North Kelly until our next meeting, please. Okay. So, uh, Councilwoman Nice would like to make a motion to defer this item. There it is. Uh, there we go. Motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Thank you. All right. Thank you. That leaves just one item, really, E1A. Uh, and so is there a motion to adopt the resolution uh, found at E2, declaring that that structure is dilapidated? Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. 
All right, 9F1 is the public hearing regarding the unsecured structures here listed, except for those that were struck at the beginning of the meeting. Francis, has anyone signed up to speak under this public hearing? No one has signed up to speak, so we would entertain a motion for 9F2, the resolution declaring that the structures are unsecured. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Brings us to 9G1. This is the public hearing regarding the abandoned buildings here listed, uh, except for those that were struck at the beginning of the meeting. Francis, has anyone signed up to speak under this public hearing? No one has signed up to speak, which means we will now turn to 9G2, the resolution declaring that the buildings are abandoned. Does anyone wish to make a motion? Excuse me, Mayor, this is okay. Chad Davidson with Code Enforcement Superintendent. Yep. Uh -huh. We'll also need to defer that um, structure at 5500 Northeast, or I'm sorry, not the one on Grand, but the one on uh, North Kelly, 2204 North Kelly. Okay, which one did that fall under? Oh, I see it on, on G. For the abandoning. Abandoned. Okay, so we're going to have to take a series of votes now. I wish you'd said that 45 seconds ago. All right, so now we're going to need a motion to rescind the resolution we just passed at 9G2. Um, okay, so is anyone, I don't know how to, is that loading, Francis, to do a motion to rescind 9G2? Okay. Okay, we've got a motion and a second to rescind the resolution. Cast your votes. Now we'll need a motion to defer item 9G1D, two weeks. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Now we'll need a motion to repass 9G2, the resolution declaring that the buildings are abandoned. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay. Now we can move on to 9H. This is a resolution approving the operation agreement for coronavirus, coronavirus relief fund, small business continuity and payroll reimbursement program and micro enterprise program with First Fidelity Bank, et cetera. I think we got a presentation on this. Yes. So Kathy O'Connor uh, with the Alliance for Economic Development is on the line to make a presentation on this agreement. This is just another agreement with the um, involving the implementation of the CARES funding for the Small Business Continuity Program. Uh, yes, good morning. This item um, is to approve an agreement with First Fidelity Bank to assist us with managing um, and implementing the second round of the Small Business Continuity um, program. Um, first, a, an informal process was conducted by the city to see what banks might be interested in assisting us with the administration of the program. The only response that we received was from First Fidelity. Um, the funding for the program, the $100,000 in administrative fees or up to $100,000 in administrative fees um, will come from the administration money that was set aside from the GOLT bond program for the first round of the program. We didn't, we didn't use all of the money set aside for administration, so we had some left over that we can use for this. The remaining um, $10 million will be the direct 
payments to the companies that apply. So um, First Fidelity will be making those payments on behalf of the city to the companies, which is why the, the agreement needs to be $10,100,000. Um, the funding for this round of the small business program comes mostly comes from the allocation of CARES Act funds. Um, if you recall, about $13 million was allocated for the small business continuity program. Some of that has been set aside for technical assistance and business retrofits. About $5 million of it was added to the first round of the small business program. And I think we spent about three, we will have about 3.5 million of that left over um, that we can put into this second round. So um, with that, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions. Yeah, I have a few questions. So what were the other banks that we informally reached out to? Um, we may need to ask Brent or Joanna that question, but I imagine that it's um, probably most of our local banks. Like I know we reached out to Bank of Oklahoma, Bank First. Um, yeah, Joanna's on the line, I think. Yeah, I think Joanna's on the line. I think Joanna's on the line and she should be able okay. to give us the list of the banks we reached out okay. to. Joanna? Oh, I, I am I can you guys hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Um, yeah, I'm pulling up my my email so that I can because uh, I spoke to them all via email. Let me um, get down there and get that list. If you have other questions, I, it might take me just a second. to get Okay, you yeah, I do have. Um, so in this process, will the bank be doing the application processing or is it still in the city's hands? to do the application processing and then we just notify them to kind of do the more administrative, I guess, piece of it? So it, it's going to be, you know, Frank, really it'll be very similar to the way we did it the first time. The website and the online application was actually developed for us by First Fidelity Bank. Mm -hmm. They donated okay. those services to us for the first round of funding and they um, reviewed and scored all of the loan applications on the okay. first round. So on this round, they will be doing all of the application intake and the review of those applications based on on, on a scoring or a criteria that is developed by city staff. And we'll have an opportunity to review all of the ones that are approved or not approved. And, and we'll have the same kind of committee structure that we've had of staff that, that's been reviewing these. Um, this time we're not looking to do loans, so these will all be grants. So we don't have that, you know, loan scoring kind of process this time. It will be more um, determining the amount that the company is eligible for and what, you know, and whether or not they meet the other basic requirements of the, of the program. You know, are they in the city limits? Are they a business that um, is allowed under the program? One thing to point out about the second round program is that we are going to open it up to nonprofits with 100 employees or fewer. So um, the first round was not open to nonprofits. So we do expect to see, um, you know, potentially more applications than we got the first time. Okay. And um, as part of that scoring, so just something that looking through the the businesses that receive funding the first time around. Um, and I've heard back from some constituents and some folks that have kind of been keeping an eye on this, that especially as this continues to go on, it, a lot of businesses that aren't really public facing, so something that is very heavily office-based, um, aren't, you know, first on, first brush, there was just, there were so many unanswered questions. I think we have a lot more of those. We still have a lot of unanswered questions about the future, but um, it just sort of seems like there's businesses that can have people work from home or can really spread people out in offices and stuff aren't nearly as disproportionately impacted as businesses that really rely on the congregation of people. So I'm thinking of like event centers, music venues, restaurants, all that. 
And so I'm curious if in this next round, if there's any opportunity for us to either include whether it's part of a council action or even just as part of a scoring process to favor and more highly score those businesses that we know are being sort of just disproportionately impacted because of just the business model itself really relies on, um, you know, I think about a lot of restaurants are already operating on incredibly thin margins and having to do this, what is the safe thing and reduce their dining capacity and stuff just puts them in an even harder place. Um, so I just curious if that's an opportunity that you all have already addressed or been thinking about. Um, and if not, what, if anything, council might be able to do to, yeah. to enact that. Well, and, and I was going to give a little bit of an update about what the second phase of this program might look like under okay. city manager reports, but I, I, I'll answer your question now. Um, a couple of you have reached out to me and several businesses in the community have reached out to me that fit into the, as you described it, venues, event centers, places that, um, you know, mostly what we've looked at are places that have an audience um, mm. are more heavily impacted at this point than even restaurants mm. um, because they just can't, they can't have a, you can't have a live music <laughs> performance. Yeah. You, can't, you just can't do it right now. So um, we are looking at that and we, we, we will bring a proposal forward to the council okay. about that. Um, so let me think of, so, and, and one thing about these programs is we try to, we've tried to measure the amount of impact that, that the business had during the time period. Um, in the first round, it was the month of mid-March to mid-April. This one will have a different time period. Okay. You know, some of that is an attempt to get money to as many businesses as possible, you know, so that we don't, if we you know, if we, if we do a hundred thousand dollars per business, we're not going to get to that many businesses, even with $10 million. So right. we do try to, um, we do try to, um, determine the, the extent of their impact and get it to those businesses that have experienced it. In the second round, we don't plan on grading or ranking the applications in the same way we did in the first round. So we, we, we ranked them and we scored those that we felt had had the most significant impact from the business closures. And this one, we don't, we don't plan to grade their papers, you know, grade their applications. We plan to um, determine the amount of the impact, you know, the dollar amount and, um, once once the the ten million dollars or so is gone, um, that will be that will be where we end it. And it has to be it has to be a reimbursement under the CARES Act legislation, which is different than the requirements we had under the Gulf Bond Program. It has to be a reimbursement for costs or uh, documentation of lost revenue. Okay. Um, so you know we we will have to. Do we'll have to review their applications and verify their information? Mm -hmm. So to that extent, they will be, you know, evaluated. I don't. We don't plan to rank them like we did the last. Okay. Time. Okay. And then one other question. So it sounds like there's going to be an, an opportunity to sort of reopen applications mm -hmm. if that hasn't already happened already. Do we have a date for that? Yeah, it hasn't happened yet because we needed okay. this agreement with First Fidelity this, yeah. and because they they have the website, they will launch the application and we need to get the application finalized, which we worked on yesterday um, afternoon for quite a okay. while. We need to get the you know information to First Fidelity about frequently asked questions and all the other kinds of things that they may come across. I would expect that we will open up this second round within the next two weeks. Okay. Okay, those are all the questions I have. So I don't know if Joanna, you were able to <laughs> pull through your email yet. Yeah, I, I've got the list here. So um, we sent the proposal to Bank First, Simmons Bank, First State Bank, uh, First Fidelity, Mid First, 
um, and Bank of Oklahoma. And I'll just let you know that I did hear back from several several of those folks individually, and they just didn't have the capacity. They're inundated with you know PPP and the small business and some of those other things, and so they did call you know and appreciate the 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 opportunity. But so that was kind of okay. Thank you. Yep. I. I would just like to take a moment to echo um, what Councilwoman Hammond is saying in terms of people who've reached out to, to me as a council person. Um, I, it's, you know, the venues and the restaurants. I believe Councilperson um, McAtee mentioned the importance of the restaurants weeks ago. Um, but I'm just really, really, I mean, I can't, I, my my concern is grave. I'll go that far. It's it's very concerning to me. Um, I'm I would just really like for us to um, take into consideration strongly uh, the importance of our restaurants, uh, which and, I, and by restaurants I mean our local small business restaurants. Um, I don't think we can afford to lose them in terms of their. Uh, cultural impact, number one in our city, economic impact on our city. Um, I just think that's that's just very important that we figure that out. Um, it sounds like we're going to be using CARES funds, but then we're also revisiting some of the um, economic alliance uh, uh, funding as we did a few months ago with that first round. So it'd be two different pots of money at once. Is that what I'm hearing? No, the, the, so the, re, the remaining, the second round is, is funded through the CARES Act. Um, if you were, when, when the city first got their $114 million in CARES Act funding, when you accepted that and set out those broad categories, you, in that resolution, you allocated an additional $5 million from the CARES Act to the first round of funding because we, the first round of the program, because we had received so many applications. So we're, so we had the five and a half million of gold bond money, and then another five million of CARES Act money. From that first round, just kind of where we are to right now, we'll probably have about three million of the CARES Act dollars left over that we can put into this second round. So the reality is all of the money that will be provided to businesses is from the CARES Act dollars. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, yes and no. Uh, it, it's just, you know, um, move, so many moving parts there. Yeah. Uh, so the only, the, 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 the Alliance for Economic Development is helping the city administer the programs. And then the second round, our responsibility will be the technical assistance piece and the business retrofits, that's all. Most of the administration will be done through First Fidelity Bank. Okay. Um, yeah, I, have we, what are our conversations like with the restaurant association right now? Like, what are they, what are they telling us that, like, what are they asking for right now uh, in terms of, you know, the need? I haven't had any conversations with the restaurant association myself. Um, I can check with Craig and others to see if they've had any, and I'll be glad to try to reach out to them. We do hear from individual restaurants um, and they're, I mean, they're struggling. I mean, there's no other way to put it. Um, just like kind of all of us are right now. So um, I do, we've had quite a bit of interest in this, the business retrofit piece of this and, and providing money for more outdoor dining so that that's the big a big part of that, um, and then um, you know, uh, so th that's mostly what I've heard from restaurants is this idea that they they would like to pursue the outdoor dining more and and they'll appreciate more money to help them with their business losses. And then what I I know you've spoken as you mentioned with some of the the venue folk. Um, just just keep us posted as we as we move through that because there, there seems to be a, like I said I have grave concerns but I can hear a bit of an anxiety in the voices of the people who are reaching out to me from that particular um, aspect of things because there's just as you all noted there's just no way you can have their their business depends on gathering right indoors mostly um, 
and I, we just can't, I, I know I might be just speaking into uh, things that you all already know, but um, I just, I, I worry it, will, it could send us back to pre Penn Square Bank moments where uh, venues like Rodeo Cinema, The Tower, um, that we, we lose them and we lost so many of them during, um, during the late 60s and 70s. I, I, it's, that is a, it's just very concerning to me. And so it's, I want to keep that at the front of our, our minds, the importance of what uniqueness they bring to our city. We absolutely agree. I mean, that was, that was our, that was why the Alliance and the Chamber worked with the city for the first round of the program, because we knew that um, the impacts, especially to restaurants and, and the cultural uh, impact they have on our city, you know, the, the creation of a real place is important. So we'll, I, you know, we will keep working on it and, um, and try to get the money out as quickly as we can. Now, I know that we have a lot of um, uh, PR materials when it comes to uh, COVID and, and the mask myths, uh, for instance. Um, and when I scroll through the city of OKC's Facebook page, I see uh, those graphics. I'm not as familiar. Do we have these graphics that are, uh, as we start rolling out this next phase in a couple of weeks, do we have these graphics that are educating folk on all the different uh, services that exist? Um, we'll be working with the city's PIO, you know, with, with Christy and her team on um, communicating to the public about all of the programs. Um, you know, in this one in particular, we had a round of marketing materials for the first phase. Since the program will be slightly different, we'll have to modify those and, and, and get them to be more, we'll get them to apply to what we're doing in this second round. So um, the answer is yes, we're gonna, we'll develop the marketing materials, we'll get the word out the best we can. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we, we had town hall meetings where we talked about it the last time, we can do that again. Um, I um, did presentations for several business groups about it. So, you know, we'll just keep working on that. And, but yes, we'll, we'll definitely have marketing materials about all the programs. Do, thank you. And yeah, I, I almost forgotten about the virtual town hall we, we all mm -hmm. did uh, several weeks ago. Um, do we already have in existence uh, any kind of infographic about the indoor, or sorry, the outdoor dining? Does, this, does that exist? I, I don't think so, um, because we really are just now getting started, but let me, let me check. DOKC is helping us with that program some so they may they may be getting the word out and I'll, I'll just have to check thank you okay any other questions on this item mayor this is david greenwell yes david um i'm going to vote no on on this item and it has nothing to do with First Fidelity Bank. They are a very well managed, very strong financially, uh, uh, just a very good bank. But um, so we've got what we have. This is still more like a prototype in terms of a uh, a process or a plan. And I've yet to receive the kind of information that I think is necessary to continue to make decisions as we go forward. Uh, so without getting into too much explanation, I'm just going to vote no, but it has nothing to do with the fact that First Fidelity Bank is involved with this. Again, they're an excellent bank, very well managed, and uh, I think very lot of them. Thank you. Thank you. I'll we do have a, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, I, I agree because uh, as far as accountability aspect of this, and, and um, I think one of the questions that we had all been asking for, for the most part, or I know I have, is just um, a list of if we were keeping track of, um, I know we were looking at the, the low to moderate income census tracts, but within that, I'm just curious as far as the diversity uh, and inclusion piece of 
of what how these dollars have been uh, divvied out and who has actually received them and who has been on the list that has not received them in the explanations, uh, a more detailed explanation as of why. And not just the ones that didn't meet uh, the area requirements. We so Kathy, we have that on the on your report on the program, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, we we um, we tracked we tracked the businesses by location. We did not we did not on the application ask for whether or not they were a minority or woman owned business. Um, and there's some challenges with doing that um, legally, but um, we do have a list of the ones that are still under review. We have about 50 that we're waiting on loan documents from, you know, for them to get loan documents back to us. And then we have about 75 that are still under review. Um, and most of those are still under review because we are waiting for them to respond to us for, for on request for additional information. Um, they didn't, either they didn't provide enough the first time or um, we needed them to clarify something in the information that they did provide. So a lot of those we're, we're waiting to hear back from the companies. Um, but we can, we can work on developing a list of the ones that were disqualified or denied and uh, with the reasons. Um, but a lot of those are, they didn't, they just didn't meet the basic criteria of the program. So, um, but I, I, we can track them by location, but I, we do not know if they are minority or women owned businesses. And I, I think that's obviously the difficulty in this because of uh, where we've seen the most impact in those spaces, uh, especially uh, for the so-called low to moderate income census tracts. Um, for it to truly benefit the folks that live in those areas. We don't even have a, a gauge of if it did. So that's really a concern for me when we're looking at, at how, how this has process has been done. Kathy, we do have information on the low to moderate income businesses, oh, yeah. right? We right. have that information. It's just not by, by minority or women owned status. Right, yes. Okay. Yeah, over 52, like 52% of the um, applications that have been funded were from low or moderate income census tracts. And our goal was 25%. Yeah, like I said, I didn't, that's nothing that I was disputing. I think, and I, I don't wanna commit necessarily some of the other council members quite yet, but I, I do think that when this comes back to us um, around the launch point in a couple weeks. I think that uh, um, another virtual town hall on social media um, discussing the specifics of the program, um, lessons learned, how folk can apply. Um, I think that would probably go a long way in a couple weeks just based on this, the, um, the responses I've been hearing in the community. I think there's still that, um, there's, yeah, I think that educational component of this is going to be important. Okay. Any other questions? We do have a citizen who signed up to speak. So why don't we why don't we go there now? Is John Pettis on the line? Mr. Pettis? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. State your name and address and uh, keep your remarks below three minutes. Good morning, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, John Pettis, 1332 Northeast 54th Street, Oklahoma City, 73111. I am confused. I've got four questions that I need to ask. Number one, and I think she, Ms. O'Connor has answered most of them, but I want to make sure. The monies that we're talking about now will be grants, right? 
The second round will be grants. And the second round totals the $10 million? Uh, yes. Okay. For, for this part my of the question. program, for the grant program. Okay. My question is, those who participated in the first round who ended up taking out a loan, will they now be eligible if they need additional funds for their business? Will they be able to come back in and get a grant? Yes, they will be able to reapply. Okay. My, my other question is that those that took out a loan in the first round, will there be any consideration of going back, making those loans grants? We have converted all of the loans from the first round into forgivable loans. So once they provide evidence that they performed, um, the, the loan will be forgiven. So they are in effect grants. And, and to clarify too, okay. Kathy, on the one. My, my, my next question. Yes. Yes, on the, on the one question that you had about whether businesses who had already received funding previously, if they'd be eligible. The one qualifier on that would be that if they've already see, received funding for a certain type of expenditure, federal funding, whether through our program or the federal program, they wouldn't be eligible to receive reimbursement for the same expenditures. So right. that would be an exception. They could still apply for the funding, but they couldn't be reimbursed for the same expenditures. Right, and they, and they also can't be reimbursed for anything that was funded from another federal program, like mm -hmm. the PPP or the EIDL. Right. So I just wanted to clarify, sorry. Yep, yeah. thank you. Okay, my next question. Uh, the, the committee that's in place, that's been in place from the first exception, first exception will still be in place during this process? Yes. Okay, so why do you why do you need the bank? What is the bank going to do if the uh, committee is going to approve the grant with the exception of right to check? Well, they're going to they're going to review the applications to make sure they comply with the requirements of the program that we're not, you know, paying a company for bit for expenses that have been covered by some other federal program or the city's first round program or the state's program. Um, they're going so to. The bank, so the bank is going to act, act as a compliance review committee uh, for the committee that initially reviews the application. Yes, you could look at it that way. They're going to make sure that the applications meet the requirements of the program and recommend an amount of grant to be provided to the business because the grants are up to a hundred thousand dollars you're not automatically going to get a hundred thousand dollars you have to demonstrate oh. what you need and what your business losses have been okay will the will the criteria for these grants be the same as it was for the first round no, they are slightly different. Like I mentioned before, we're going, we're not going to score or rank the applications. Um, this is more of a first come first serve until we run out of money. Um, and um, so the criteria are a little bit different. Uh, there's several criteria that will be changed, but that will be very clear on the application and the instructions when we launch the website. Okay, and in the agreement uh, within the uh, website is proposed to be up, up in about a week after this meeting, the application should be online in a week? I would say two weeks. Okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pettis. All right. Are there any more questions or comments on this item? We're still on 9H. Yes, uh, sorry, point of clarification. So I understand that someone 
who has received funds previously from that first round, uh, they can apply again, but let's say they were, they received something regarding their, um, their payroll, right? Um, that means that as this program, but phase two comes online, they wouldn't be able to apply again for their payroll um, losses. For the, for the same time period. So for example, for most businesses, the PPP expired in, in June. So they could apply to cover their payroll expense. The PPP expired in June, they could apply to cover their payroll expenses in July, for example. It can't be the, for the same time period. It could be the same type of, of expense. It just can't be that they already received dollars for that particular time period. So, okay, because that was a little bit of confusion for me, um, just making sure that it makes sense now that they, if they received it for one time period previously, now as they reapply, it's for this next uh, several weeks uh, that weren't included in that previous iteration. So that does make, make sense. Um, yeah, I, again, I can't stress enough. I just, I think that as, as this moves online, as it did the first time, I think having, um, perhaps Kathy and um, maybe even some local small business owners um, with us in a virtual town hall on social media. Those were really well attended and people seem to really find them informative. I think that would be a, that would go a long way um, as to with any infographics. <laughs> and I just wanna, I also have a oops, sorry, point of clarification. So the things about like prioritizing businesses or I, I can't remember exactly what the language was in the first round, but that are in like low income census tracts and, and that sort of thing, that's not gonna be part of First Fidelity's review. It's more just like you apply, you hit the basic, uh, the basic like points of you, can you can prove a loss of whatever amount and like I so can you clarify so, that for me so the, the location of the business is not a criteria that rules you other if you are in the city limits you are eligible all we're doing is documenting which of the businesses are in low to moderate census tracts it is not a factor that determines whether or not they get funding but there was with the first round there was like the stated goal right and, and that, we, have that same, we have that same goal for this second okay phase of the program. yeah but and so that language is still part of the yes. structure okay okay yes absolutely do we know if the the ones that are under review are do we have the money earmarked for those that are under review for, for before this second round or are we just moving forward as is? Um, we've set aside a few hundred thousand dollars to cover those that are still under review. Thank you. Okay, any more questions, comments? We could, uh, if not, we could move to motions, I suppose on this item, 9H. I believe the opportunity is open if someone would like to make a motion. <laughs> Somebody wants to, great. Uh, I don't know how to interpret this. Is someone, is someone trying to make a motion or are they just having technical difficulties? Okay, there we go. All right, got a motion in a second, cast your votes. Passes eight to one. Okay, we are now going to go back to the item regarding the streetcars. We now have Jason Fairbrush, transit director on the line. This is item 9C. Um, so this is an ordinance on final hearing that was deferred from an earlier time, a much simpler time, March 31st, 2020. And uh, this, this whole item relates to illegal parking next to the Along the streetcar street line, yes. 
So Jason is on the line to help us. And then I have stated before that Steve Christ was the attorney who'd worked on this. Actually, it's Haley Ralston. She's on the line as well, but Jason will provide the information that was requested. Yes. Uh, good morning, Mayor and Council. Uh, Jason Fairbrush, Director of Public Transportation and Parking. Uh, apologies for uh, not being signed on as a panelist earlier to where I could provide comment, but um, glad to be able to provide uh, an update on this item uh, now. Um, so as the mayor had mentioned, um, this is, was deferred from March 31st, and we had originally uh, introduced this ordinance um, really with uh, trying to, to find a way to address uh, blockages along the streetcar route. And so what the, or, what the ordinance change primarily is doing is <clears throat> defining a um, uh, vehicle as a traffic obstruction or a traffic hazard Anytime there's a vehicle block, uh, blocking uh, any part of the streetcar track envelope, right? Um, and so <clears throat> that was important for us to change that definition um, so that we could identify those vehicles blocking the route, even though they may still be within the required distance of the curb. And then the second part, of course, of, of this, and the one we had the most discussion on was changing the fine. Currently, the fine is $50, and we were proposing increasing that um, to $130 um, through discussions and um, interaction with council. Uh, one of the things that we had committed as a department to do um, was identify uh, some of those hot spots, if you will, the places where we were having the most blockages along the route and try to add some additional signage to inform our residents that you know not only um, could they potentially be towed but there would be a fine involved because part of the discussion was you know um, residents may not know that they could be fined even for uh, parking and blocking the streetcar route so um, we have um, put out um, <coughs> some signage and i'm going to see if i can get this on the on the screen here, but basically we've added these temporary uh, signs that you see here. Um, they're uh, designed to, you know, try to uh, stand out and get the, the motorist's attention, um, reminding um, residents, you know, don't get fined, park inside the white line. And so we do have those signs installed at um, uh, four, at least four different locations um, throughout the route. And then our commitment was to monitor um, the blockages after uh, we put those signs up and see if, you know, just advising residents that there was involved, if that would change behaviors and um, basically reduce the blockages and encourage people to park correctly. Um, so all of that is in place um, as a department. We've done that. We've kept that commitment. We've begun tracking some of that data. Um, However, as we know, things have dramatically changed since March and traffic counts in downtown Oklahoma City are, you know, considerably less than what they were. So what I can do, and, and thank you for letting me give you the background. So what I can do is provide you with like a quick update on where we're at in terms of blockages um, <clears throat> with uh, uh, the, the, the pandemic essentially hitting and um, the restrictions being in place in April and May, we only had three blockages system-wide, right? <laughs> so there just wasn't a lot of traffic uh, wow. downtown. Um, in June and July, we have, with the traffic picking up uh, throughout the route, we have seen the blockages uh, pick up a bit. We're now at about 10 to 15 blockages per week along the route. Um, that is still down from about 20 to uh, 25, uh, which is what we were experiencing in January and February. And um, I know myself and others have noticed that significant decline in blockages because not only do we track it, but several of us, including myself, are notified on our cell phone anytime we have a blockage. So it's, it's uh, always at top of mind. Um, but I know what you're interested in is really what have we seen in terms of um, reduction in blockages where we put the signs. And um, until this morning, um, we, we have not had any uh, blockages uh, where we have installed these temporary signs. Now that's really, you know, just about a three week monitoring period 
but it is, you know, I guess I would say the busiest three weeks we've had probably traffic wise, um, you know, since March when this item was originally um, discussed. So, um, so am I confident in saying, you know, these signs are going to dramatically impact and change parking behaviors? Um, probably not at this point, just because of the limited data and not having the normal traffic flows downtown. Uh, but if the last, you know, two to three weeks is any um, evidence, um, they, I would say they're definitely promising. Are there sort of new hot, like those 10 to 15 ha happening per week? Are they, is there any trend in like where those are, or are they just kind of tend to be kind of everywhere across the route? Yeah, at, at this point, yeah, we haven't really identified any new places where we would want to target the sign uh, or, you know, target for additional signs. But again, I think until our traffic counts get kind of back to normal, uh, it'll be a little difficult to find those, find yeah. those spots. Well, given that, I don't know if anyone else has any questions or anything, but I was curious about, I think to your point about not really having kind of normal data, I would be interested in seeing if we can defer this maybe for another four to five months. I don't know if that kind of feels like maybe too much time or not enough, or if you have maybe a, a recommendation of how long you think we might be able to kind of get a better sense, um, just given that we're still not back to kind of that comparing what we were a year ago, just traffic wise and Right. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're, you know, we're obviously happy to accommodate whatever council's desire is. Um, I think the, the minimum we would want to push it, push it out and for us for monitoring would be 90 days. And that's just with mm -hmm. the expe expectation that if the next 90 days are, are similar to the last 60, we're going to see, you know, traffic Something. pick up and more activity. Mm -hmm. And at the end of 90 days, we may be closer to where we were. Um, I mean, that's mm -hmm. just speculation on my part, but we're certainly willing to, to take yeah. another look at it at that time. Okay. I mean, unless someone had, has any objections, I would be interested in making a motion to defer this item for three months, 90 days, whatever that looks like as far as our calendar schedule. Uh, Francis is probably looking it up right now. Okay. Jason, while they're uh, looking 90 at that. days about a meeting 90 days from now, three months. David, did you have a question for Jason? I'm yes, sorry. Yes, thank you. Excuse Go me. Go ahead while uh, she's looking at it. Yeah. So, Jason, what happens now when you have these 15 blockages a week? What What's required of you? Yeah. So, operationally, uh, operationally, what we do is the, the operator will, of course, uh, stop the streetcar, call into the OCC, the operations center. We'll send a supervisor to the scene where the blockage is, and that supervisor uh, will begin trying to identify uh, the owner of the illegally parked vehicle while at the same time uh, initiating a call to the police department for assistance. Uh, because ultimately, if we can't find the owner, we will want to tow the vehicle. That happens very rarely. Typically what happens is the route supervisor is able to, you know, identify who, the, who owns the vehicle and, and they're able to move it before uh, really towing or a citation is involved. But, you know, again, it just goes back to shutting really the entire system down every time that happens. Right. So how, how long is the system shut down on average, just roughly guessing when you encounter this? Yeah, I'd say roughly about 10 minutes. Well, uh, you know, I think it's an impediment to uh, encourage the use of the uh, streetcar uh, when we have declines, even though, I mean, uh, delays, even though they've declined in numbers just due to uh, lower activity in the downtown area. I would say my preference is to move forward with this. Um, okay, so Francis suggests that for a council member who wishes to defer it three months, the date she proposes would be October 27th. Um, so maybe a, a motion to defer always takes precedence, so maybe we start there and see how that yeah. goes. 
Yeah, I'd like to make that motion. I'd second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to defer to October 27th. Uh, whenever you're available, cast your vote. Passes eight to one. Okay, that item is deferred. Let's all remember this moment and try not to have to completely forget it by the time October rolls around. All right, this brings us back to item 9i. This is a resolution approving the non-emergency ambulance transport rate increase to $900 per transport, et cetera. I believe we have a presentation, Mr. City Manager. Yes, uh, Jim Wenham, the CEO for IMSA is on the line and will present the information. Good morning, Jim Wenham with IMSA. Uh, bringing this forth uh, for several issues that have, were brought up last year. We looked at our uh, rate comparisons throughout the area of, of, of Oklahoma City uh, back in July and September, I think was the time frame of last year. And we found that our rates uh, were significantly lower than everybody else in the area or in the market uh, immediately in our area and actually in Oklahoma. Uh, in fact, the cost ranges were $1,200 for the highest roughly to $743 for the lowest for non-emergency transports. Now these are calls that are actually from the hospital to a nursing home and they're scheduled in advance or they're scheduled during the day for people that need stretcher uh, requirement and under the care of a physician. Um, the last rate increase we had was in 2008. And since that time, there's been significant changes uh, both in the reimbursement and uh, both for Medicare and Medicaid and commercial payers since that time. We've also seen a significant increase in the number of non-emergency transports. For example, in 2015, we ran about 3,600 a year and now about 7,000 mark per year. And that's what we're trending for uh, for this fiscal year. There's also four levels of non-emergency transports and each of those have a different reimbursement rate. Uh, so we charge currently $393. And I give you an example for one contracted payer, uh, there's a ALS, a BLS, LS2, SCT, and essentially those are just the acuity of patient. And they pay uh, $705 for one, $600 for another, $1,600 for another, and $1,900 for another. So we're leaving significant money on the table. And uh, in actuality, in the Western Division, in Oklahoma City metropolitan area, we lose $23.09 per transport. And that's about $250,000 a year based on our budgeted transports. So we're proposing a rate of $900, uh, which transports, uh, which translates into an income per transport of about $15.16 per transport and that gains about $413,000 into the Western Division operating uh, budget. More importantly, uh, this rate uh, increase places uh, us in the middle or the average compared to our competitors, and that is required uh, by the uh, Office of Inspector General, uh, OIG. Uh, you cannot be below the fair market value. It also puts us uh, in compliance with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid Services that we cannot lose money on transport uh, purposes. So those both have put us in compliance with those. And out of those 11,000 transports that we do, uh, just over half, 52% of them reside in our service area uh, around Oklahoma City. And of that 52%, only 12% is affected by the rate increase or roughly about 683 transports. So 88% of the patients that we transport have a contracted third party payer that will pay for that and, will not, and they will not be affected by the rate increase. So it does not affect Medicare, Medicaid patients. It does not, uh, you know, VA, US, PHS, uh, even motor vehicle accidents, et cetera. So it, it's affecting roughly about 6% of the self-pay, uh, which have no insurance. And uh, that would bring us uh, 
roughly, I said about 683 transports, a rough estimate right there. And by doing so, this brings us into compliance with CMS and OIG. Uh, there is a potential that there could be uh, legal consequences for not meeting the fair market value and not meeting the losing the cost uh, on each transport. And we need to head that off. The last time we increased our rates was 2008. Uh, actually, our trust indenture has a component in it that these should have been looked at every year. And it's on several, idea, uh, several reasons, mainly the con uh, medical consumer price index. Uh, and I cannot speak to why that was not accomplished during that time. Uh, so that's why we're bringing you such a, uh, a heavy rate increase right now to bring us back into compliance. So uh, that's a quick brief overview and I'm certainly happy to answer any questions any of you may have. Any questions? Yes, um, thank you for the presentation and for updating, updating us on this particular item. Could you speak uh, again to the, uh, for folk who, um, might be on our lower income scale, what sort of um, assistance is available for them? Um, right. Normally, and then just going forward, please. Sure, sure. Uh, it, it, one, if they are a participant in the IMSA Care membership program, and let's say they don't have any insurance, then there are four forty percent discount of that rate, uh, particularly. Uh, so it would be roughly five hundred and forty dollars. If they, we take each individual case. If it's a hardship case, we will look at those, uh, and our uh, patient billing services will work with them on a, you know, pay five dollars a month or whatever is necessary, uh, or sometimes it's written off based on the particular hardship. Uh, most of the people have. Uh, that don't have insurance, uh, that are not on MSA care, that's how those are handled, sir. We try to work with each and every one because we understand this is a, 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 a service that's important to the public. Uh, unfortunately, it's very expensive to provide EMS services, uh, but we do look at each and every one of the hard cases that we can, sir. Uh, a point of, 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 of reference here also, with our $393 rate, we have roughly about a 50% uh, collection rate on that, uh, which is really good. By going to the 900, that brings us you know, down to roughly about 36% collection rate is what we anticipate on that. And that's how we come out with the uh, $15.16 that we would make on that call, sir. Great, and this information is available where uh, again? For for uh, in terms of hardship and IMSA care, they our patient billing services will contact them, and it's also I, I believe available on our website. Uh, but most of those situations where somebody's unable to pay, uh, we will contact them, and and or they can contact us either way, either direction, and, and work on issues to help them out in, if necessary. There's a specific process built into billing department uh, to take care of those, sir. And I'd be happy to send you that information. Uh, yeah, that, that would be helpful. Um, and I was just kind of, you know, when it comes to uh, debt and collections, I'm always mindful of how anxiety works. And so I know for some folks, totally you know, who, uh, uh, you know, they received that medical bill in the mail and they, they kind of, freeze in some ways and, and we'll, you know, set that bill aside um, to the point where then it, they end up in collections. And so whatever we can do to avoid those sorts of scenarios, especially for, as you point out, a, a service um, that's as vital as this, but also as expensive as this one. Yes, sir. Well, and, and you know, we don't automatically just send them to collections. We will try to work with them and talk with them first. And uh, often that's a last ditch effort. Yeah, and I appreciate hearing about the monthly installments and, and as low as, five, uh, as, as you're talking about, I think that's, that's very helpful. And again, thank you for the service you provide as well. Yes, thank you. Any other comments or questions? If not, we could uh, accept a motion to adopt the resolution.
We've got a motion and a second. Go ahead and cast your vote. Passes unanimously. All right, that brings us to item 9J, resolution adopting the City of Oklahoma City Emergency Operations Plan as revised and authorizing the city manager to implement the emergency operations plan, et cetera. Mr. City Manager, I believe we might have a presentation from the yes. unsinkable Frank Barnes. Yes, yes, the Frank Barnes is on uh, to provide us an update on the, or the information on the update on the emergency operations plan. Really do want to just reiterate uh, my appreciation for Frank and his leadership and his team uh, for the work that they've done through the uh, pandemic, both externally and you know, providing information for our, for our council and for residents, the work they do externally, the work that they do internally within our uh, operations. So I really appreciate his leadership in this program. Okay, uh, thank you, city manager. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Uh, uh, good morning. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor and City Council, for this opportunity to uh, present to you the City's Emergency Operations Plan for Adoption. We do this every year, um, and it, we do it not only because it's required um, by law, but also uh, to fulfill one of our federal grant requirements. So um, when we talk about our emergency operations plan, um, we have a term uh, called polycentric response. And uh, the response to an emergency or disaster um, is actually a polycentric response. And what that means is that you have multiple organizations who respond to the emergency or crisis, who act under their own authorities uh, and will perform their assigned roles or responsibilities. Um, there's no centralized command or control that you might find in, in other uh, parts of the world. Uh, the, um, the polycentric response allows uh, private sector as well as non uh, government organizations such as churches or faith-based organizations uh, to participate in the response and the recovery. Uh, each organization does uh, what it what they do best uh, and government uh, does not try to do it all. Um, the, the government does what we do best or city government does what we do best and that's uh, handling the public safety, uh, the debris uh, clearance and removal and the restoration of city-owned uh, infrastructure and, uh, and facilities. We've had uh, guests come to Oklahoma City from Ireland, from Japan, from Taiwan to, to see how we do things. And when we explain how, how we respond, they, we get these kind of quizzical looks because where they come from, they have a much more centralized command and control. Um, and it's hard for them to grasp this polycentric response, but that's how we do, do things in this country. Um, you know, when there's an emergency, people respond and they, they do what they're supposed to do. Uh, and that's why uh, the emphasis of this emergency operations plan is coordination, because when you have these uh, government, non-government and private sector organizations responding, uh, performing their various roles uh, and responsibilities, it becomes important to coordinate uh, what they are doing. Uh, think of it as a multi-lane highway where everyone is traveling in their lane and that uh, you, know, you coordinate uh, with the other drivers when you want to change lanes by uh, using your turn signal. Um, it's also a framework. It's not a step-by-step -step guide. It's, it's not a, a procedure, a procedural document. Um, it doesn't have the, the answer to everything in it. Um, the plan relies very heavily on resourcefulness, creativity, and improvisation. Um, it's also an all-hazards plan, and so the, the general public uh, thinks that uh, we have a plan for everything. I think he froze up. Yeah, we lost his connection there, it looks like. Do you still have him on? Frank, I believe you froze up. And then the reality is that people are just fine, but a better way to explain uh, the hazards is this way, if you have a uh, building collapse and people are trapped inside that building, the response to that structural collapse and to save the people um, inside that structure will be the same regardless of why it fell down. Whether it fell down because of, of a weather event or an act of terrorism 
uh, natural gas explosion or some other uh, mechanical malfunction of the structure, uh, the response will, will be the same. Um, it applies to uh, the entire city, not, uh, not just the geographical part of the you know, outlay of the city, but also to all city departments. Um, it's always active. It does not require someone to activate the plan. And you'll read that in some textbooks and literature where they'll talk about activating the plan. Ours is always active. It doesn't have to wait for somebody to activate it. Um, it's also scalable and flexible um, for any kind, type, uh, or size of events. We can scale up, scale down, uh, depending on, on the size of the event. So in 2020, um, we don't have a lot of changes. They're actually um, would be considered minor. We went ahead and added a paragraph in the basic plan that explained the polycentric response. Uh, we've been using that term for years and thought it's Are we all station or terminology? Um, no matter how many times we look at this document, we keep finding where uh, some changes we may have made a year or two years ago, but we didn't catch every one of those. So standardizing the terminology for uh, Oklahoma City Office of Emergency Management or the term um, emergency management uh, director, making sure that's standardized throughout the document. Um, in the glossary, uh, we went in and we revised and added additional terms or words. Uh, as well as revising some definitions. Some of the, the definitions changed with the um, 2017 National Incident Management System. Um, and uh, when that was rolled out, uh, again, some of the terminology changed. So we wanted to make sure the definitions were consistent with NIMS 2017. Uh, we also went in and, and revised or added uh, 16 abbreviations or acronyms that uh, we realized were, were missing from, from the document. And lastly, under the emergency support function matrix, which is at the very taking out some entities that, that no longer existed or no longer had a defined role or responsibility, or we revised it to reflect the correct name of the, the organization. So in uh, 2021 for next year, uh, one of the things we'll be doing is we will be um, updating Appendix A, which is the situation overview. Uh, we, we tend to do that every couple of years. and we uh, have the planning department assist us with this at appendix up to date. Also, we'll be uh, updating the hazard vulnerability analysis annex um, as well. Uh, we try to do that every so many years. That particular annex is based on calendar year data. So it's hard midway through a calendar year to update it. So again, we'll make updates in 2021 that will reflect Okay, is there any questions for Frank? Yeah, it seemed like there was there were moments where that was cutting out um, for us. So there were some things I feel like we missed. There were some moments where it just picked right back up, but there were others where there weren't. Yeah, there might have been a tech. I got a little warning that there may have been a problem with the internet connection. Uh, I can go over it again if you want me to. Not necessary, not necessary. Uh, okay. James, is there a specific thing that you felt like an area that you felt you could like repeated? Not necessarily. I think my main kind of question right now is what have we, what is, what do you feel we've learned from our uh, recent experiences um, coordinating all these different efforts, I guess what you call polycentric centers. Uh, what have we learned um, from this pandemic experience that we're taking forward into this particular resolution? Well, we're still doing, we're still assessing um, 
the pandemic response, um, we are in the process of gathering information to prepare a um, after action report, which is required by one of our, our federal grants. Um, and we have to have it turned in by the end of September. So that process is still ongoing, so it's not complete. But one of the things that, that you know, are this many Frank we lost you at one of those things months as we got deeper into the event um, and things became more complex and there were more demands and there was a lot of things coming at us from different directions um, there was a tendency for mm. Yeah, Frank. Organization of uh, responding to that disaster or the, or the pandemic. Frank. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, we, we heard almost nothing of what you just said. You might go back to oh, the no. beginning, I think. <laughs> okay, let's try it again. Um, so we haven't uh, we haven't completed our after action report for the pandemic it's still ongoing um, it's uh, we have to turn it in by the end of September to comply with one of our federal grants but one takeaway is the importance of coordination and information sharing amongst all the entities and all the different levels um, and we found that as things began as the the, the pandemic or the crisis. You calling? Frank? Yeah. It looks like that dial-up modem that I sold in might have. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. How much did he I didn't know case? if it was his or mine. He tended to retreat back into their cylinder. All right. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Because apparently I keep losing my signal. You do. I don't know that it's going to get any better. I, um, I don't know. Short answers maybe is uh, <laughs> the secret? I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, we'll give it a third try. Um, yeah, I hear you right now. Is the importance of coordination and information sharing. Did you get that? Yes, good. <laughs> good answer. Okay, any uh, other questions for Frank, he asked with dread. Okay, no more questions for Frank. Obviously he's available to all of you uh, independently and probably under better conditions if, uh, if you wanna visit with him later. Uh, we would entertain a motion to adopt the resolution found at 9J at this point. Okay, we've got a motion in a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Now we're at 9K1 and 2, and I believe we do want to go into executive session to address this item. Uh, any vote uh, for 9K1 would occur, obviously, in public after the executive session. So 9K2 would be the matter on the table now. Is there a motion to go into executive session? So motion in a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Uh, we will handle that at the conclusion of our other business. 9L1, uh, resolution approving the request for salary continuation for firefighter Joseph Young while he continues to require rehab. I don't believe we need executive session. Is there a motion? We've got a motion in a second. Cast your votes.
Passes unanimously. 9M1 is a resolution authorizing and directing the municipal counselor to initiate an action in the District Court of Oklahoma County to enjoin the use of the property at 4600 Val Verde Drive for short-term rental. And we do have a couple of citizens who have signed up to speak. I believe it was our intention, Kenny, it was your advice that we were not going to need to go in executive session or discuss it, but I do need to hear from these citizens. Is that... May I, may I speak yeah. about this, sure. Ron? Uh, of course, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, um, there are a couple of people that want to speak today, but more importantly, this all um, goes back to January of 2019 when we passed Ordinance 26081, which is our home sharing ordinance. Um, for those of us that drafted that ordinance, we spent a lot of time uh, talking to uh, neighborhood participants that were concerned about safety and the well-being of their children. I'm getting a lot of static, a lot of noise from someone. At any rate, the, the ordinance passed. It was there to protect neighborhoods. And uh, this house that uh, these two people are gonna talk about today is located at uh, 4600 Verde Drive. Um, this all dates back to uh, a January 2020 application where it was alleged that the homeowner uh, filed falsified information to obtain their license. And the homeowner also ignored mortgage provisions that were filed of record that they could not uh, lease the home. Uh, the license was revoked. There was an appeal uh, to the uh, license appeal board. I'm really getting a lot of noise. I can barely hear myself think. I am not hearing anything. Is anyone else hearing that? Barely. Okay. Okay. At any Sorry, rate, Mark. Um, the, the, the legal and the, the supervisor of licensing took a look at this. They revoked the license. The owner appealed this to a hearing on uh, June 26th in front of the, uh, the licensing appeal board. At that time, there was evidence put on that the homeowner, which claimed vis-a-vis -vis an Oklahoma driver's license that they lived in the house, uh, actually uh, lived somewhere outside of uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Um, this, this house, I get more calls on this house than any other land use case I have. And um, there will be evidence that none of the neighbors ever saw a moving truck or saw anybody move in. There is not weekly trash cans. There's not weekly mowing. There's not daily newspapers. There's no one that's ever come out of the house and said, hi, I'm your neighbor, I moved here. Uh, the same car is never in the driveway. But most importantly, when the house is rented out, and I'm gonna talk about that in a second, when the house is rented out, the neighbors go and knock and ask to speak to the owner when things occur that are disturbing to them. And the renter states, we don't know who you're talking about when, when the homeowner's name is given, that person is not here in the house. And so I, I think it's important uh, that these neighbors that have to endure this every day are able to speak um, to a house that's advertised that it allows up to 16 people to sleep in it. Think about that, 16 people to sleep in a house. Think of the cars, think of the traffic, um, think about your children uh, playing in the street. Uh, so I understand why I get more calls about this than, than any other neighborhood. And um, what we're asking you to do today is to give us the authority uh, to allow our city attorney to go into court and get an injunction, writ of mandamus, whatever's necessary to stop this wrongful conduct uh, from occurring. And it is our understanding that after, after the licensing board unanimously rejected the license on June 26th, the homeowner continued to rent it out. So they're avoiding orders that have been issued by the city. They're not taking us seriously, they're trying to put a stop to this. And at this time, I'll turn it over to the two homeowners that would like to speak. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, Dave Amos, are you on the line, Dave? Yes, I am. Good morning, Hi, Mayor. Dave. 
Good morning. Just uh, state your name and address and uh, keep your remarks to three minutes. Okay, I'm Dave Amos. I live at uh, 5001 Echo Glen Circle in Val Verde, and it's the corner of Val Verde Drive and Echo Glen. So I'm down the street from 4600 Val Verde Drive. Um, I'm at home quite a bit of the time, and I, the homeowner, I'm in the HOA president. And uh, so I'm on my bicycle early in the morning. I'm coming in late at night from a date with my wife. I'm back and forth in front of that house all the time. And I will raise my hand and put my hand on a Bible and go under oath. I'll sign an affidavit and say, no one lives permanently at 4600 Valverde Drive. Um, I've watched this house being operated as an Airbnb before their license was approved through the city in uh, December, January. I've watched it being rented out after June 26th until as recently as yesterday. And uh, these people that own this home just flaunt the law. They're thumbing their nose at the neighbors. They have no regard for us. There's trash in the streets. There's pizza boxes, vodka bottles. Uh, my, uh, the speaker next, Amanda lives next door and she'll speak to the uh, insanity that goes on on a weekly basis over here. Their applications, uh, we got our hands on uh, their mortgage. They applied for a mortgage and stated it's their primary residence. Uh, they they do not, or um, they their uh, mortgage documents were uh, were falsified. Um, they've been offering operating uh, illegally for the last two weeks, and uh, it's just uh, our neighbors here some of them are the original homeowners and so they're up in their years they're used to a quality of life uh, where it's quiet and serene through here and uh, these people come through here and sleeping 16 people and uh, you know cars up and down both sides of the street it's a safety hazard because if there's a fire uh, there's two ways into this street one off 122nd one off a of meridian and if a house caught on fire with a party in going on, uh, there's no way a fire truck can get in here. So I would ask, uh, ladies and gentlemen of the city council, would you please authorize Mr. Jordan and the other municipal councilors to pursue a permanent injunction on this property, the rental of this property? Thank you very much. Yeah, and before Amanda speaks, one other thing I forgot to say, when we drafted this ordinance with the input of a, a lot of neighborhoods, um, th th there was th there was it was asked over and over that they make a special we make a special exception that if it's not your primary residence, then then the neighbors have to be notified. Number one, and number two, you have to get that ex special exception through the board of adjustments, where neighbors in the neighborhood can come and tell you just what Mr. Amos said: uh, fire trucks can't get in there. Uh, when there's there's 10, 15 cars and 16 people spending the night. And so uh, they are trying to skirt, they are trying to avoid uh, this special exception requirement to have the Board of Adjustments uh, review this and determine whether they are an appropriate site for an Airbnb along the grounds of safety. And uh, we should not cater to their efforts to avoid uh, a formal review that's required by the ordinance. Amanda? Amanda, so, yeah, go ahead. Okay. So what this item does is allows the municipal counselor's office to review this case, no, all of the remedies. Amanda, Amanda, I was talking about the second speaker. Oh. oh. <laughs> Amanda, Sorry, we, we were all confused about that. Sorry, Mark, we thought Amanda, you had Amanda, Amanda Nykirk. Okay, Amanda Nykirk, are you on the line? Hear me? <laughs> yes. Can Amanda? you hear me? I guess. Yes. Please say I'm your name and address. Thank you. There's a lot of Amandas out there, so I'm used to that. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for letting me speak. Um, 
my husband and I moved into our home on January 9th. Um, we are located right next door to 4600 Valverde. And from the beginning, uh, there were issues. We couldn't even get our moving truck down the street to get into our driveway uh, because of the parties. So from the get-go, um, there have been parties. There have been hip-hop videos uh, filmed. There have been, uh, it has been rented out for weddings for 20th. Uh, anniversary parties. Um, they have charged admission. They have had red velvet ropes on Stanton's outside, like a club. Um, it's been nonstop noise and loud music, uh, which really has affected our right to um, just peace and, and, you know, enjoyment of our own home. Um, there are people coming and going constantly. I started taking pictures of what was there. Um, and I, I won't bore you with my 37 pages of pictures showing different cars, but um, I will show you, I mean, there are cars parked in the yard. There are cars um, showing, They at one point in time, they had a party where they were valeting people into the home. And when I spoke to the person and asked for the A songs, which are the homeowners, I was told that um, they were having a VIP event only party Mind you, this was in May when we were still not being asked to have 10 or more people gathered together, but large parties were happening. Uh, when this first began, they were advertising 25 plus people. The home could help, could sleep 25 plus people and parties for a fee. They have since monitored that and changed that because of the complaints. But I will say this did begin. If you look on VRBO and Airbnb, they had um, reviews as early as December. They purchased the home in November, immediately began renting it out, and um, have been doing that without a permit now since. Um, I do want to really quickly, I know I've got a lot of time here, but or not a lot of time, but I do want to go over our covenants and restrictions. So our covenants um, and restrictions are attached to the plat of land, a plat and subdivision that the city approved. And those covenants say a business cannot operate in a home. Uh, in this neighborhood. So that is one of the main things. And then they also, the covenants state very strongly that it has to be a single family residence only. So these are these are legal things that, that you know, the city did approve that in the plat. Um, the homeowners have received the constructive notice of this when they closed. Uh, and then they've also received actual notice from the HOA. This is a business because this is a business permit per the city's classification. So they are operating an unpermitted license and they continue to do so even after the revocation. And I do have proof of that. So with that being said, um, I would make a motion uh, to adopt this resolution. Okay. We We'll have that digitally here in a moment. We've got a motion in a second. Hey, may I just interject? This, mm -hmm. this mission is reminding me that I reached out to our planning department uh, requesting a list of um, properties in our wards um, with out-of-state property owners. Um, I, I received it, and I want to thank them for that. Uh, they've also forwarded me uh, a list of best practices uh, that other cities have taken to um, address this issue. Um, and I, I look forward to reviewing those because I think that's, that's also part of the problem here. It's not, yes, this is, you know, about in this home sharing moment, we're seeing the sort of um, uh, consequences that the, uh, the people who just spoke described. But I have to tell you, a lot of the residents in my ward describe similar uh, type problems uh, for uh, buildings that out-of-state property owners own that give way to people, all kinds of different people being able to go in there, set up shop, uh, start bonfires to keep warm and this sort of stuff. My point being, it might be worth our time to, um, to look at addressing that side of things too. Like, it's not to detract from this. It's to say that this is a major concern that we heard out um, in our, at least I did in my ward. I just wanted to interject that here. Yeah, James, and I'd encourage you to look at 59-9350.38.1, where we address this. And, uh, and when we addressed it, 
I can remember talking to someone saying, you know, at some point in time, we're going to have to see how this works and we'll probably have to come back and look at it and see of, of ways to improve, improve this. And now may be the time. Okay, so we have a motion and a second on this item. Any further discussion? Hearing none, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Okay, moving on to nine in one. Claims recommended for denial. There are three listed. I don't believe we need executive session. We would entertain a motion. Got a motion and a second. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. Moving on to 10A1, claim recommended for approval. Don't believe we need executive session and or would entertain a motion. Got a motion and a second, cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right, this, per, this brings us to item 11, items from council. We'll uh, deal with the listed item first before we go around the horseshoe. That is item 11A, resolution of the city council establishing a required comment period of 20 days on proposed city FY budgets, et cetera. This comes from the charter review committee, which is co-chaired uh, by Councilman Stunsipher and Councilman Cooper also serves on it. Uh, we maybe start with you, Councilman uh, Stonecipher. Yeah, one of the things that we uh, looked at was, uh, we looked at a lot of things, but one of the things we looked at was uh, the budget and, uh, and from our discussions evolved uh, some ideas, mainly uh, from James, uh, about a resolution uh, to have a comment period on the budget. Uh, I think we talked to some of, of uh, the folks that oversee the budget. Uh, I, I think they're comfortable with that process. James, if you'd like to uh, um, expound upon that, uh, I'd be more than happy to turn the floor over to you. But there are a couple of, in the resolution, I think, corrections that need to be made. And I'd like to speak to those in just a minute. Yeah, I appreciate um, your work on this, Councilman. This was something that residents in our um, in our community brought to our attention and just really enshrining this into language for our, our residents so that they know um, more about the, the budget process um, and how to, uh, how to participate. I think it's just very important. Um, that's, that's really all I would add. I just think it's important and, and uh, I appreciate the, the work here. Craig, could you, could you look at exhibit A for a second? Please. Yes. Oh, just a second. Good. Okay. I should have told you before we. I'm good. I got it here. Okay. okay. And mainly, these are just for purposes of clarification and also uh, to not overburden our staff. But uh, in A, it says in the month of May. Uh, I think it could uh, it could be the month of May or June. That's my first thought. On D, okay. on D, uh, just so we don't kill staff. In the one, two, third sentence down, the second sentence from the last. Um, the presentation, so we don't kill staff, would be the first or second regular or special meeting. Uh, number three, E, uh, the second line where it says the city council may and shall adopt a budget. We don't, we don't have a, a, a may option. 
under the constitution we have to adopt a budget and so i would strike may and the language may and and then under f you with me craig yes yes okay the, the the last the last line it's talking about expenditures for given purposes and the proposed means I don't think we mean financing them. I, I think what we mean is the, the payment of those expenditures because all of those expenditures are not financed. And so if I were gonna do it, I would, I would make those uh, one, two, three, four changes. The fourth change being that you change the term financing them to, fin to payment of the, of the expenditures. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes, the only question I would have for Craig or Doug Dowler is if you change A, you add June in there, does that allow you time to get the 20 days in? This, I have this, to think about it. I think Go ahead, Doug. June first. I think if we did June 1st, we could make it work. It's 30 days before the beginning of the new year. And so my thought would be June 1st. Yeah. Would That'd be the only yeah. day that would work. Well, yeah. it, it, it's just that short period, then forget it. We'll, we'll just leave it the month of May. So then I'd only have three changes. There would be a change to D, there would be a change to E, and there would be a change to F. Are you okay with that, Doug? Uh, if, if, could you remind me, on, I, and I don't have it in front of me, I don't have the resolution here. I can uh, try to pull it up in terms of the you said in terms of compiling the com the comments to respond to council. The only yeah. thing the only thing I did with D was if you needed it, I gave you a little breathing space to report back to council uh, the substance of those comments. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Of like the first or second meeting. Yeah, and then and then on E, I deleted may adopt a budget. We we don't have an option. Sure. May exactly. adopt. We exactly. Have to adopt it. Yeah. And then in, in paragraph F, where we're talking about expenditures, um, it, it just says the proposed means for financing them. And that's not accurate. What we do is we, the, the means for payment of those expenditures. Yeah, so really what we could say on that maybe is the means for funding them. Yeah, I think that's that even, was what was intended. That's, that's even better. Funding instead of them saying the expenditures. Okay, hold on just a second. So the term for financing them is out of the statute. Is that correct? Kenny was telling me this. Yes, I took that directly out of the statute. That's the definition that was in the statute. And, and I appreciate Kenny's clarification. I do I do understand what Councilman Stonecipher is talking about, that a lot of people, when you say financing, think of the fact that you're going to borrow money for something. You can say funding, too. So I, like so I, I like the edit in there, but I appreciate the clarification that that was out of the statute. Mark, I heard the the first two where we're or the last two where we're striking May and then this funding conversation. I'm sorry, would you walk me back through the first couple of recommendations? Sure. There's just one other, uh, James. It's in D, mm -hmm. uh, so we don't burden our staff too much. Like, I mean all the hoops they were jumping through to redo the budget uh, during this pandemic. Uh, I gave them a little breathing room and I said the first or second, not just the first. You, you see what I'm saying? You're talking about in the third line there in D? Yes, yes, please. So I'm, I'm a, I, should, I could use some clarification on D now that you're saying that. Because it's saying the first or second meeting after the expiration of the 20 days. So I thought the 20 days was referencing um, <clears throat> you're, you're going to put the budget out. There's going to be a 20 day comment period. Right. We'll, we'll get together those comments and what it says is uh, you will provide to the city council 
uh, the substance of those comments for our, our thought and consideration. And the only thing I was saying was, um, if, you, if you limit it to the first, that would have been difficult this year. Yeah. I just put okay. first or second as a fallback if we're having trouble. All right. James, you okay with that? Yeah, and just again, point of clarification, if I'm understanding that correctly too. So those 20 uh, calendar days would be preceding this first meeting. So, right. Yeah, yeah, the 20 days pertains to once we put it online, that starts the 20 days running. And then after, after the 20 days runs and we've received, let's say we re received five comments or 500 comments or whatever, uh, then the staff has to have some time to uh, assimilate and put together the substance of those comments to present to us. And I just wanted to give them a little breathing room in case we got 500 comments. Okay. Yeah, yes, this, this approach works. Okay. And, and, I, and I, Craig, I definitely want to make sure that you and Doug were okay with that. Hey, Craig, this is David yes. Greenwell. Yes. So uh, in a normal year, when do you normally have the budget pretty well in your mind uh, ready to present to the council? Is it like May 1st, May 15th, April May, 15th? Yeah, I would say May 1st is typically around when we uh, present the budget. Sometimes we, we have had a few years where just the way the calendar worked out, it was like the last uh, council meeting in April, but typically it's the first council meeting in May. Okay. Now, Mark or James, under these uh, new guidelines, would the staff be able to make any presentations to the city council between May 1st when it was published and say May 20th? or no presentations can be made to the city council? No, no they still make the presentations. And, yeah. uh, and, and if you're uncomfortable with 20 days, I, I just, a comment period, the, the more input we can have from the public, the more transparent we are, the better, the better our budget is. And so if, if you're more comfortable with 10 days for a comment period, uh, I, I, I'm fine with that. But- uh, Well, I was just thinking, if, if you used 14 days and and uh, the city management had a goal of creating the budget by May 1st and we had a 14 day window, then they could begin because it would seem appropriate to include those comments when the budget is being presented to the council. Sure, sure. Or, or was that not a... A I have, I have desire. No I, I think. I think clarification too is that the, the intent, as I understand it, is that we would post the budget so it's available for the public to see by a certain time. You know, by by the month of May, and then there's a comment period that's allowed where people can provide comments, provide input that we'll forward to the council. But during that comment period. We are continuing our regular meetings, you know, taking finance committee meetings to the, or taking the, the uh, budget meetings where we set aside those times and present the budget to the council. And so those would continue on that process, we continue on. You're exactly right, Craig, that, that's, that's the intent. I mean, anybody, any citizen can make a comment to their, their council person or send it to the city manager or send it to Doug uh, at any time. Prior yes, to our and, final vote. and when we have those meetings, typically we have public hearings on those meetings. We go ahead and have those as public hearings where we're making presentations, but citizens could, could make comments at any time during that process. Okay, so let me just ask a naive question. And like you just said, Mark, we currently receive feedback from the public without this uh set of procedures you know as we go through the budget right I, I i agree with you totally so this does what now 
what it does is identify uh, to people, to citizens at large, uh, that they have a right to uh, look at the budget once it's posted and, and, and send us comments to make each one of our meetings more meaningful. Okay. And I do think we got some comments this past budget process uh, as we were going and listening to those various presentations. I agree. Yeah, and my preference would be to to keep the, this 20 day number. Um, if I remember at first, uh, the recommendation from some of the residents was an entire month. And so 20 was already that, that sort of, um, that middle ground there and my thinking through this and it sounds like uh, city manager Freeman is suggesting the same thing is that you know the public will probably have more comments as they hear these presentations right from the different departments um, okay James so this is really designed not to allow the city council to adopt a budget quicker than 20 days after it's posted exactly yeah, that's fine. I'm OK with that. Yeah, anything. no problem. Thank you. So, James, do you want to make a motion? Yes, I would make a motion to approve. Uh, do we need to do the it with amendments first? The uh, with, with the amendments yes. I mentioned yes. in subparagraph yeah. D, E, and F. Yeah, so I would make a motion to move with the amendments. OK, so you're moving the amendments. Yes. yes. We've got a, a motion and waiting on a second. Got a second. Cast your vote. Uh, on my screen, Councilman McAtee hasn't voted. Councilman McAtee, are you, have you voted? Councilman McAtee, are you there? Uh, I'm here. I'm having trouble getting the vote to count. How do you wish to vote? I'm trying to vote yay. OK. There it goes. Great. All right, the amendments passed unanimously. Now we're on the resolution at 11A as amended. Is there any further discussion, to, questions, or a motion? James, do you want to make that motion? Yes, Councilman. I would uh, motion to move uh, the uh, proposal, please. Got a motion and a second to adopt the resolution. Cast your votes. Passes unanimously. All right. That's the only item under items from council. Now we'll go around the horseshoe. Ward one. I don't have anything there. Okay, thank you. Ward two. Yes, um, I just want to thank uh, Councilman uh, Stonecipher again for his work uh, last week with um, the mask ordinance. And um, as someone who comes from, as you all know, uh, uh, education, background, um, I was really, uh, it was really encouraging to watch all of you, all, all the council members um, collaborate to, uh, to draft that particular ordinance. It, it was, it, it reminded me of like a group work project in a way that I, I haven't seen uh, us really do on the council with the exception of MAPS 4. Um, and so I just wanted to applaud uh, again, uh, Councilman Stone Cipher and um, everyone who participated in that. Also, want to thank everybody who participated in the special meeting uh, last Thursday, the OKC County Health Board, and any of our uh, first responders and health providers who uh, who participated in that. Want to thank everybody in Ward Two who reached out um, to me, whether they spoke in uh, support or opposition to the ordinance. I really, I'm um, just glad. Uh, to receive those emails. I'll, I'll also say um, I had caught up on all my email responses last Wednesday. And there were already a couple hundred. And then from Thursday uh, onward, I received 
it, I, I don't know, three, 400 more. And so I'm, uh, I am responding accordingly. To that same point, I'd really like to thank our council staff who last week saw a volume of calls and emails that is my understanding is unprecedented for them. And I just really wanna thank them for their hard work uh, answering those calls, responding to emails. Um, as I said, I, I, it must be somewhere at least in the five to 600 neighborhood uh, that I received in just Ward 2. Um, and so if you've reached out to me, just know that I'm, I'm working my way through all of those, those responses, just as I worked my way through the um, couple hundred uh, emails I received related to um, policing last month. Um, I take that seriously, uh, so I'm working on those. Um, I also wanna say that every, every bit of uh, evidence that we heard last Thursday is why I cast that vote. And, um, and yeah, so I just wanna, again, uh, thank everybody for their work on, on that. And, uh, to all of the small businesses in Oklahoma City and specifically in Ward 2, I would encourage strongly reaching out to our congressional delegation as Congress and the White House works to craft the next COVID relief package. They have until the end of this month, friends, to do that um, before they leave for their August recess. And so at the city level, we're, we're doing the best we can, uh, whether it's been the, uh, the grants, the loans, this uh, face mask uh, ordinance, which just this weekend, just Sunday on Instagram, I received a, uh, uh, a tag from one of the small business owners here, a bookstore, uh, saying that they, they saw an increase in traffic to their store once the mask ordinance went in place. People feel on the large part safer going into public so long as they can still practice those six feet social distancing rules and washing their hands regularly. Uh, the mask ordinance, that, that was a really helpful comment to hear from that small business owner. And I wanna thank them for, for reaching out. But the mask is only part of the solution and I'm just gonna keep saying it because the amount of frustration that I'm hearing from our small business owners, um, it, it's breaking my heart, especially our restaurants and our bars and our event venues. Um, but the only way, the only way we're going to get out of this moment is with a partnership with a willing federal government who understands the need for a common united defense. And to those who don't believe that the virus is real, to those who don't believe um, the, uh, the, the numbers, the, the nursing shortages, um, I, I just, just please implore you to go back to last Thursday and watch that presentation from OU Medicine and from uh, OKC County Health. Um, this is not the moment for conspiracy theories. This is the moment to, uh, for action. And I believe strongly that Congress needs to invest in our small businesses with this next relief package before they recess in August. We can't afford for them to recess in August and do nothing and wait for a presidential election in November. This is bigger than politics. This is not about which side of a political aisle one finds themselves. This is a matter of life and liberty right now. The freedom to own a business. The, the, you can only secure the blessings of liberty if you are alive. And we've got to do everything we can to invest in our small businesses so that they can weather this storm. We also need to do everything we can to invest in, in our individuals. I'm so worried about so many of my Ward 2 residents, the whole city, when it comes to uh, what happens when these unemployment benefits run out. I also keep hearing this argument when it comes to those unemployment benefits and, and making clear to everyone watching, listening, city council, that's not our purview. Uh, that is a state level thing. Uh, 
on the account of receiving funds from the federal government as a response to COVID. But this idea that giving someone unemployment benefits right now during this historic pandemic is a disincentive to seek employment. I need to be very clear on that. That is a false argument. Until individuals feel safe, until we have done everything we can to make the workforce as safe as possible, there is no job for them to go do. And moreover, I, I know what some people would say, oh, well, I see this pizza joint hiring right over on the road. Um, yeah, and then look and see where some of these increased cases are happening. It is our essential workers on the front line, the people who are low income, lower middle class, middle class who are working in these retail sectors, working in our grocery stores, delivering our food. Um, they are putting their lives at increased risk so that the rest of us can eat. This is the same in our uh, meat processing facilities. These are, these are our essential workers and the work they're doing is putting them at increased risk. And we have got to make sure that Congress is going to do what they can to invest in those individuals. Um, it's just critical. I, I really worry how we get to, to, um, to the end of the year in so many ways. I applaud the efforts that our city has taken. Um, we are a well-run city, but we need a partner at the state and federal level to help us uh, meet this moment. So uh, I just wanna make sure again, that my small businesses know that they have a council person who hears them. Please take my recommendations, reach out to your delegation because um, we're all in this moment together. It's the Oklahoma standard. Thank you. Thank you. Ward three. Uh, nothing today. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Ward four. I'm good, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Ward five. David, are you there? Ward five. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Uh, no comments. Thank you. Okay. Ward six. Yeah, I just kind of quickly wanted to echo Councilperson Cooper's sentiments regarding just gratitude to Councilman Stone Cipher um, for work, his work on the mask ordinance. And um, in particular, I just really wanna point out the data that we got related to what zip codes have the highest increases in cases. Um, I think it was given to us on Friday um, for that past week. And it's been a pretty similar trend for the past few weeks that out of all of the whole state, out of like the top 10 zip codes that continue to have the highest rate of increases um, of cases week to week are, there are four of those zip codes that are solidly within or border or share some part of Ward 6, largely the South side. And I wanna just specifically mention that because um, to, I think, Funny that you mentioned it, Councilperson Cooper, but um, to that point is those are the, I mean, if you look at the census data for those areas, they are typically living the average, um, I believe the average income is typically anywhere from 20 to maybe $30,000, maybe, um, but 30 plus percent, 30 to 50% of those zip codes uh, live below the, at or below the poverty line. Um, so, Correlation isn't always causation, but I think often we can see in those numbers that um, there's a heavy correlation between people who work jobs that put them in one that do not have good good living wage pay, but also put them in a lot of contact with the public and also tend to live in multi generational households. Um, there's a lot of overlap in in all of this data, and so to the point of supporting our small businesses and um, particularly our Latino businesses on the South side. Um, I just keep hearing um, about this. The, and even I, I believe it was part of the presentation last week with the city county health department that um, we are see, starting to see that really disproportionate rise in our uh, Latino population um, that they're starting to get cases at a higher level than they're proportionate to um, their representation in the overall ethnic makeup of our city. 
Um, and again, those are folks that are often working in jobs where they are coming in contact with more, more of the public um, and uh, often working jobs that do not pay them a living wage. Um, so I'm, I'm working with a few people and groups to maybe try to have a particular focus on getting some information and resources out to folks in that demographic and those zip codes, um, just knowing that it's probably a mixture of all of those things that are contributing to those numbers. Um, and again, just to the point of um, those, those really needed resources, uh, this week is the um, week that we've all been dreading as far as um, the, the expiration of the Federal CARES Act eviction moratorium. Um, so we still have about a month probably till we'll be able to really start seeing the effects of it, but we'll be able to start seeing, seeing people be able to file for evictions. Um, and with a lot of people behind on being able to pay rent because of job loss, because of waiting months and months and months for unemployment um, support. Um, and, uh, and it's just, we're in a bad spot. So I'm grateful that all we've been able, been able to do as a city to allocate dollars, but I even know from, this was from a few weeks ago, but that the community action agency had actually put a halt on accepting applications because they had so many that they didn't want to run out of our money um, from the CDBG allocations uh, and have, you know, a myriad of additional applications to walk through. So I know that the state has put some money towards, um, towards doing that as well as, as kind of replenishing some of these different nonprofits that are processing these types of applications. But um, everything I've heard so far is that the need um, is so much greater. Um, and these are folks that are not just applying to places like the Community Action Agency, but they're also trying to hound the unemployment, the economic, or the OESC, and they're trying to look for a job. They're doing all of these things all at once. And um, it's just a huge burden on people who uh, already were kind of not, you know, in a great spot economically before this all happened. Um, and to that point also, I, I think it's, um, I was planning on asking this anyway, but I think it's timely that um, Jared Shadid was our employee of the month because I'd, I'd really love to request a presentation from the city manager, uh, whether it's Jared or I don't know if it'd be an assistant city manager that's over planning, um, but about our point in time count that we had. I know they published um, the document about that, but I think it'd be really great to have that um, presented to council as well as the general public. Um, to kind of walk through those numbers and um, and see what that might mean, especially as we think about the looming um, continued eviction crisis in our state generally, but then as it, specifically as it relates to our um, the COVID pandemic. So that's all. We, we will get that scheduled. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ward 7? Yes. <clears throat> I just want to um, also thank... Uh, Councilman Stone Cipher for the leading the charge for our mask mandate uh, that was voted in, and I also want to take the time to, to thank those that reached out to to our office and obviously our city staff for all their hard efforts with working with us and, and working through us uh, to ensure that uh, folks were being heard. Um, and I wanted to make mention of just, you know, just a couple of, of folks that I know the, and I don't want people to think we don't read what you send because we do. And I'm, I'm mindful of uh, one email that I received from a, a gentleman by the name of Sammy. Um, and he's currently undergoing cancer treatment. And he basically reached out and said, uh, that he needed this, this mask mandate because he can't afford to get sick but he knows he needs to work. Um, and, and that's just where we are right now when it comes to a lot of our, our folks in our community, they, they have to work. They have to meet the need for our families, especially as we just heard with the eviction moratorium, among other things uh, that are piling up for uh, a lot of our vulnerable and, and those who unfortunately have to live paycheck to paycheck. Uh, so we are, are thankful, and uh, I must say I've seen quite a few folks out. I know I've been, I wear mine, but it's, it's nice to see others with theirs on as well. 
And to that point, um, one of the questions and concerns that we talked about even with our, our open discussion with the Oklahoma City County Health Department was the need for more testing. So I, I do wanna make mention of the Perry Clawson Tuesdays and Thursdays, uh, which is located on, on the, in the Metro Tech area. Um, so if anyone needs to get tested there, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays from 8 to 10 a.m., they will be testing. And of course, uh, the Northeast Regional a Campus for the Oklahoma City County Health Department from 8 to 3 in uh, CVS locations. And we I know we have one, a CVS location located on 23rd and MLK. So those are some testing sites for our community. And um, when I know of more, I'll make sure we continue to spread the message and hopefully we can get more. And I, I think it's again, important for us to, to note and take, take caution to the fact that the CDC didn't just show up in Oklahoma uh, because we're doing okay. They showed up because our numbers spiked in a very unusual manner and quickly. So that's why they came uh, last week to get more knowledge and understand what was taking place, what had happened and how we can move forward um, to make sure we're slowing the spread for, for our city and as well as our state. So I just encourage everyone as well to continue to wash your hands and socially and, and safely distance yourself as much as you can um, and uh, to uh, wear that face mask, the face mask or face covering, whatever is available to you. And I, I did, I'll make mention of this too, because I, re I received an a, a inbox from a, a woman who said, I always make stuff about race. Um, but I, I obviously, when you aren't used to um, being on the opposite end of when things happen, you would never understand uh, what what takes place. And I, I I go back to other cities where we know uh, this has they have been vulnerable vulnerable communities have been taken advantage of um, and also cited or stopped or any kind of provocation because of them wearing a mask and they may not look uh, like others. So I just want to make mention that I'm, I'm not going to stop speaking about the vulnerable or uh, the communities that I represent because these are valid concerns for for the people that I serve. And um, that, that part I just wanted to continue to talk about. I know uh, I wanted to make mention too, tomorrow is yoga in the park. You can socially distance and do some yoga with us. And we'll be at January 15th and MLK from six to seven. And that's with OKC Beautiful. Uh, so we did that a couple of weeks ago and it was a lot of fun. So come on out. I know Urban League, um, they're preparing for their virtual back to school bash. So hopefully uh, our families are able to participate in that. And every Saturday, I want to continue to thank our Parks Department at Pitts Recreation Center. It's the Northeast Farmer's Market. And we want you to come patron the Northeast Farmer's Market. It's bigger and better every week. And Metro Tech also is offering Tai Chi, yoga, uh, and Pilates classes. So it's free of charge. We just want you to come out and, and enjoy, enjoy that space. Uh, before I finish, I want to make my last comment to say uh, a late happy birthday. We did send um, a letter of recognition to Mr. Clyde Joe Houston. He turned 100 on Friday, July 17th, and he served in World War II, and he also played in the Negro Baseball League. And I understand the key to his longevity is playing dominoes, walking five miles a day as a centenarian, walking five miles a day and watching news and sports. So I um, wanted to just wish him again a, a very happy birthday, especially during a time like this. And I know he has eight, eight children, 24 grandchildren, 60 great grandchildren and 35 great, great grandchildren. Uh, so I, I'm sure he had a lot of love on Friday for his birthday. So uh, those are my comments. I'm sure I'll probably forgot something, but we'll get it on the next round. Thank you so much. Thank you, Forte.
Uh, Mayor, I'm sorry. I hate to break the order, but Councilwoman and I said something that I cannot let go. Super important. Speaking of birthdays, I believe the Honorable Councilwoman had one over the weekend, and I've already said happy birthday to her there, but I think in public that's necessary. I believe there was another, I, I hope I said it a few weeks ago, but I believe another Honorable Councilwoman had a birthday recently, uh, Joe Beth Hammond, and uh, the rest of y'all council members need to tell me when your birthdays are coming so I can keep <laughs> back of the two city manager um it just it's been an honor to work with with all of you but especially you two it's, it's just been uh, i learned a lot um I'll, also reminded me uh much love and all kinds of respect to the civil rights leaders we lost um this weekend as well um they um they paved the way and uh, now it's time to keep keep paving with them okay thank you four day Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just briefly, in this pandemic world we find ourselves in today, once in a while it's nice to get some news, good news, uh, even if it's in short duration. I was going to call on Craig Freeman to uh, uh, let the public know about the July 20 sales and use tax collection, collections in comparison to the projections that we had set forth. Could you kind of share that with everyone, Craig? Sure. Yeah, so the um, collections for the year, so, you know, we've been dropping off. We've seen May and June were double-digit declines, and we actually had a um, decline of 7.8% in July, and I didn't think I would ever say a decline of 7.8% in sales tax <laughs> is good news, but um, projection for the year is down 5%. We did expect to see a July be worse than what it was, um, and so we'd actually projected in the first quarter that each – each of the months in the first quarter would be down 12%, and uh, being down 7.8% is good news. We'll have to continue to monitor. We got to be careful looking just at one month, but um, I still say we take what good news we have right now. And between sales and use tax, both came in. We projected declines on both of them, and both of them came in um, uh, better than what we had projected. And so I mean, overall, we're about 1.4. Craig, as far as sales tax performance, uh, uh, we had 20 million come in. We projected 19. We had a 4.8 percent change. Is that right? Right, right. It's it's 4.8 percent above target. So it's a 7.8 percent decline compared to the same month last year. Yeah. So it's still down, down almost 8 percent. But we were projecting down 12 percent right now in this first quarter, and so it's better than what we had projected, which puts us ahead of target. But I would just, and I think that's great news. I would just caution it's something we're going to have to watch as we go ahead and see how uh, what effect COVID has on the economy uh, going forward. And, and the good thing we had we had better than projected on the use use tax numbers. That's right? correct. Yes. Yeah. And, and so I, I want to juxtapose that with uh, what I read in the paper today, which was the unemployment rates uh, in Oklahoma dropped from uh, May to June from 12.6 percent uh, in May to 6.6 percent in June which makes Oklahoma tied with Maine for the uh, fifth lowest unemployment rates in the nation. I don't know if that's going to continue. I'm praying that it continues. Uh, the one thing I would say is that uh, uh, Federal Reserve Chair uh, Robert Kaplan from Dallas uh, said the economy has started to grow since late May. Uh, I am hopeful that it will continue to grow. Uh, this takes time, but we all need to work together on getting our economy to grow. And if you have any ideas on how to help our economy grow in Oklahoma City, please feel share, please feel free to share that with uh, our city staff or call your council person. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. That concludes items from council. Now we're at item 12, city manager report. Yes, sir. So we have um, a couple of presentations. One of them is actually on the schedule and another one we're going to add in um, at the request from the special meetings at the end of the week. But Kathy O'Connor is going to provide the update on the small business continuity program. Okay. Um, just as a little bit of extra information from what we've already covered. Um, we have processed 315 applications um, and approved approved funding for about 6.3 million. As I mentioned earlier, there's about 50 that we're pending receipt of loan documents and vendor forms in order to pay them. 
Um, 52% of the funding has been provided to businesses in low to moderate income areas. We have about $3.7 million remaining from that initial allocation of 10 and a half million and 75 applications that are still under review. Anything left over from that first, the first round of the program will be rolled into the, the second phase. Um, you've, had, you've asked a couple of questions about the second round of the program. So some of the differences are going to be that we are going to open it up to nonprofits. Um, it will also be available for businesses with 100 employees or fewer, the first round, the maximum number of employees for any of the programs was 50, so a little bit broader um, set of businesses that can qualify. Um, we will consider applications from businesses that have been in business as of February 15th, 2020. In the first round, you had to be in business for one year in order to um, qualify. Um, a couple of other things that we are we are um, looking to be able to provide in this next round is uh, reimbursement for uh, PPE, for masks and other kinds of uh, supplies. Um, so a business can apply to have those kinds of expenses reimbursed. Um, and then the business retrofits is a new component as well. So any changes that the a business needs to make to it to the way it, it performs its activities in order to provide better social distancing, um, uh, air filtration systems, as I mentioned that earlier, the streetery program or the outdoor dining um, component of this is also a part of the second round. And we'll also continue the technical assistance piece as well. Um, also, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are looking at some kind of program for, for venues that have live performances where you sell tickets and have an audience because those kinds of businesses have been very heavily impacted and continue to be. They really can't reopen in the same manner that they were before. So, um, and, and that, may be true for some time to come, as some of you have noted earlier. Um, I think that's about it on the update. Um, we, we do have about 270 applications that have been disqualified for various reasons. Um, and we'll uh, continue to report on, on the program as we process more applications. I think I mentioned earlier, we plan to open up the second round um, within a, a week or two. Um, hopefully by, by the middle of next week, we can get the application out. Kathy, and I'm not sure if you're the right person to ask, maybe someone else could look into it. If, if not, when it comes to our restaurants, like you made me think about it when you mentioned the venue spaces, um, you know, having those larger gatherings, as we know is, is uh, what indoor especially is what makes one more susceptible to um, catching the virus. In terms of our restaurants, I, I, I'm trying to think, what is, what is, are, do we have restaurants that uh, have a stated capacity of over 25? I mean, it's been so long since I've been in a restaurant, I don't even remember what the space is like. Uh, um, is this common? I mean, what, what sort of capacity are our restaurants usually at? I think probably most restaurants have a capacity of it, like, I mean, it depends on how big their space is, but some restaurants can hold a couple hundred people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Thank you. Well, I just want to say thank you to, oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a question, Nikki? I'm sorry. Yes. Um, as I was looking at this, I've been looking for at it for probably at least the last few days. And What's the difference between review complete, awaiting response, and under review? Because I, I realize after review complete, there's no nothing after that. There's no dollar amount, so there's um, in I, that's I guess that's where it comes into play, where people are calling and asking questions because it's just kind of in limbo in some aspects, and then the awaiting response, and then under review. So awaiting response means we're waiting for a response from the business. 
and under review means that staff is still looking at that to see if they have everything they need to to determine how much funding the company might be eligible for. Review Let's complete means that it's probably in the process of it, it's in the process of paying them something. We might still be waiting for a vendor form or some other kind of documentation to make payment, but um, once the review is complete, we begin to process those for payment. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you to Kathy for her leadership in this program and the Alliance of Econ Free Economic Development. Um, their staff, the chamber staff, some cha staff from um, economic development with Joanna's leadership have put a lot of work into these programs and I really appreciate their work. First Fidelity has been a great partner and continued uh, relationship with them as we extend the program. We're looking forward to seeing the results of that. So thank you. Thank you, Craig. Thank you to city council. It's, it's been a very interesting program to work on. <laughs> Yes, thank you, Kathy. So I'd also ask Christy Yeager to provide a presentation after our discussions at the meetings last week on the marketing plans um, related to the masking ordinance. The And really, they, they, her folks have been doing a really good job in social media and in marketing, just encouraging people to take precautions to help um, address the issues related to COVID. And so, I wanted her just to give us a presentation on some of the discussions we've had um, to initiate the marketing um, with the changes that we have in place now. Thanks, Craig. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Yes. Um, I just want to start out by recognizing, again, the public information staff for all their hard work since March. We've been working late nights and weekends to maintain our continuity of operations while still communicating essential information about the pandemic to residents. And I want to specifically shout out to Michael Kimball and Zach Nash for the relentless efforts on social media. Um, Facebook, Twitter, and Nextdoor are our most effective and most cost efficient communication tools when it comes to resident outreach and education. In fact, since March, we've posted about uh, 1,000 pandemic related messages on Twitter and those generated about 3.8 million impressions. So we're getting the word out um, fabulously on Twitter. OKC.gov has had about 4.8 million visitors since March, many of them accessing our COVID-19 content. And then when we think about what happened on Friday with our face mask ordinance, um, we had more than half a million people that have seen our face mask requirement post. And they left about 4,000 comments, all debating the pros and cons of face masks. Everyone has an opinion and they're not afraid to share it, that's for sure. Um, and then on Nextdoor, which is a fabulous tool that we have that goes to neighborhoods, uh, we've had our information about face masks that were delivered to about 150,000 people, and that's about 37% of our households in Oklahoma City. So we're, we're glad to have all of those outlets so that we don't, you know, at one time we depended on the media to provide information, all of our information, and it's nice now to have that control and not depend on them, although they're doing an excellent job. The communication team led by LT Knighton at OCCHD have been amazing partners throughout this crisis for us. They've done an extraordinary job messaging under um, an immense amount of pressure. And just kind of thinking about this marketing plan, we actually met with the City County Health Department and the Chamber yesterday and agreed to partner on a cohesive campaign. Um, and our goals are to encourage the use of face masks and distribute them to the public. We wanna continue providing data and facts about COVID-19. We wanna watch for misinformation that's out there and try to correct that and provide testing information to residents through a, a marketing plan. And OCCHD has about a million dollars from CARES Act funding allocated to messaging. So that's completely encouraging. 
We discussed everything from TV, radio, social media ads in both English and Spanish, billboards and ads on bus benches and shelters. And I know um, the nice thing about this is we can watch the case numbers and place advertising in census tracts or zip codes that are experiencing outbreaks so we can be responsive. Social media allows us to do that as well. Um, we also agreed when we talked that it's important to get more masks out into the hands of agencies that serve people who need them most. So the purchase of masks is going to be a part of this plan. Um, and in fact, when I was talking to OCCHD, LT told me that she's already provided about 50,000 disposable masks to agencies like the Lynn Institute, LCDA, Urban League, and some churches around the city. So in summary, we're really excited to partner with these agencies and we plan to get to work pretty quickly. Um, but I wanted to kind of take it a little further and tell you like on a related note, we're also wanted to uh, mention my appreciation to Beth Krauts and the Action Center because she worked extremely fast to create a mechanism for residents to report businesses and other indoor facilities that are not complying with um, the mask ordinance. So people can report concerns about the mask ordinance four ways. They can go to our website at okc.gov, then click on the report it tab. They can check out our mobile app, which is called OKC Connect and report concerns that way. They can email action.center at okc.gov and they can text 2521053. And Beth visited with the Oklahoma City County Health Department and they agreed to follow up on concerns with education. Having said all that, um, you know, I talked a little bit about marketing and I'd love to get everybody's input on ways uh, that you have to get the word out. So that concludes my presentation. Christy, yes. do you have any thoughts on, um, I guess, so OCCHD is no longer going to use the numbers uh, supplied by the State Department of Health, is the last news I saw on that. Any thoughts on that or how that's going to change looking at our data over an extended period of time? Um, I mean, I just, I think it's critical that we get the correct information out of, so if they're doing that to make that information more correct, then it's going to help us with communicating with transparency. So. We'll, we'll make sure too, Councilman, we have uh, briefings with Phil May Tubby on Thursday. And if we don't get something to back to you all on that prior to that time, we'll make sure that we get that incorporated in that briefing. I, I appreciate it. I don't think I'm going to be at that briefing because I think I have another uh, committee meeting at the same time. So, okay. Well, we'll get you the information. All right. Thanks. That, that's all you got for city manager reports today? Yes, and then we already talked about the uh, sales tax report. Yep, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes, Go ahead, Christy. Yeah, first, okay. thank, thank you, Christy. And thank you to your staff for the work you all have undertaken from the very beginning of, of this, this city's response. It's, I don't know that we'll ever know how many hours you all have spent uh, dedicating um, yourself to this work. Um, just critical, the work that you all are doing. You know that, but I feel like it's important to say that to you in public. Um, in terms of um, people being able to um, reach out in regards to concerns they have when they don't see the, the mask, uh, you said they can go to our city website and under report they'll find? Uh, yes. It. On OKC.gov, you'll see a button that says report it, and it goes straight to the Action Center's reporting tool. Okay. And at the top of that, it says COVID-19 face mask response or something along those lines. OKC Connect as an app is another way? Yes. And then you said they could reach out to action.center? At OKC.gov. Cool. And they can text mm -hmm. us at 252-1053. Okay. 
And um, I'm guessing at some point there will probably be these infographic, an infographic could maybe even have that. Yes, well, we're going to put one together. We just wanted to kind of um, let the city county health department catch their breath a little bit and just kind of run this out kind of slowly. I mean, not completely slowly, but uh, we just, I think we're going to get uh, overwhelmed with concerns. So, but we'll get this out um, in the next few days. Thank you. I also, that this reminds me how important it is to commend uh, LT Knighton and, and Phil and their crew at Oklahoma City County Health for all their work, specifically for the graphics, the informational graphics they are creating, they've released. I've been just sharing their post on Instagram. Specifically, thank you to LT for sending me some that were in uh, multiple, multiple languages too. I thought that was just so helpful. Um, so I just really appreciate uh, you all's work on that. Uh, do we have a, I, again, respecting people needing to catch their breath, are we looking at the same kind of two week unrolling uh, of, of this campaign that we that were probably anticipating with the small business um, CARES Act stuff? I think that Anglin PR is gonna take the lead on that aspect of it. Um, they have been doing a lot of work with um, businesses and trying to find businesses that might need it. So I feel like if my office, if I started that, it'd be like reinventing the wheel, but they've got a lot of research behind them on that subject. So I think they're going to be taking it on for us. And we probably see that within the next week or two. Um, I'll have to talk to Kathy, but I would think in the next two weeks. Okay. Um, and then yeah, I think all of that, I think that's all good. I, I really also to Councilman Stone's comments last week, um, I think, you know, uh, the messaging too, in terms of, you know, we're, we're in this together, that Oklahoma standard right. messaging, um, giving, giving people something to rally around in addition to the informational stuff we're already uh, sending, sending out. You know, that's the big focus that the chamber is interested in doing. And that's what they brought to the campaign was this kind of uh, do it. I think they, they said, uh, well, I don't want to ruin their surprise campaign, but they have a cute, <laughs> some, some cute ideas as far as that's concerned and getting people rallied around the idea of everybody being safe. Thank you so much again, Christy. Thank you. Okay. That concludes city manager reports. Uh, we have no one who has signed up to speak under item 13, citizens to be heard. We will now return to item 9K2, which is an executive session. And uh, after that, we may potentially consider item 9K1. Uh, with that, I believe Francis, we will each of us log out of this Zoom and use the Zoom invite we received regarding executive session to rejoin. Yes, it's 7.30 this morning is okay. when I sent your email. All right, and then we will come back here. So we are...